Part Three, Chapter Two of Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky, translated by Constance Garnett, 1861 to 1946. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part Three, Chapter Two. Razumihin waked up next morning at eight o'clock, troubled and serious. He found himself confronted with many new and unlooked-for perplexities. He had never expected that he would ever wake up feeling like that. He remembered every detail of the previous day, and he knew that a perfectly novel experience had befallen him, that he had received an impression unlike anything he had known before. At the same time he recognized clearly that the dream which had fired his imagination was hopelessly unattainable, so unattainable that he felt positively ashamed of it and he hastened to pass to the other more practical cares and difficulties bequeathed him by that thrice accursed yesterday. The most awful recollection of the previous day was the way he had shown himself base and mean, not only because he had been drunk, but because he had taken advantage of the young girl's position to abuse her fiancé in his stupid jealousy, knowing nothing of their mutual relations and obligations, and next to nothing of the man himself and what right had he to criticize him in that hasty and unguarded manner? Who had asked for his opinion? Was it thinkable that such a creature as Avdotya Romanovna would be marrying an unworthy man for money? So there must be something in him. The lodgings? But, after all, how could he know the character of the lodgings? He was furnishing a flat. Foo! How despicable it all was! And what justification was it that he was drunk. Such a stupid excuse was even more degrading. In wine is truth, and the truth had all come out, that is, all the uncleanness of his coarse and envious heart. And would such a dream ever be permissible to him, Razumian? What was he beside such a girl, he, the drunken, noisy braggart of last night? Was it possible to imagine so absurd and cynical a juxtaposition? Razumian blushed desperately at the very idea, and suddenly the recollection forced itself vividly upon him of how he had said last night on the stairs that the landlady would be jealous of Avdotya Romanovna. That was simply intolerable. He brought his fist down heavily on the kitchen stove, hurt his hand, and sent one of the bricks flying. "'Of course,' he muttered to himself a minute later with a feeling of self-abasement. Of course, all these infamies can never be wiped out or smoothed over, and so it's useless even to think of it, and I must go to them in silence and do my duty, in silence too, and not ask forgiveness, and say nothing, for all is lost now." And yet, as he dressed, he examined his attire more carefully than usual. He hadn't another suit. If he had had, perhaps he wouldn't have put it on. I would have made a point of not putting it on. But in any case, he could not remain a cynic and a dirty sloven. He had no right to offend the feelings of others, especially when they were in need of his assistance and asking him to see them. He brushed his clothes carefully. His linen was always decent. In that respect, he was especially clean. He washed that morning scrupulously. He got some soap from Nastasia. He washed his hair, his neck, and especially his hands. When it came to the question whether to shave his stubby chin or not, Praskovia Pavlovna had capital razors that had been left by her late husband. The question was angrily answered in the negative. Let it stay as it is. What if they think that I shaved on purpose, too? They certainly would think so. Not on any account. And the worst of it was, he was so coarse, so dirty he had the manners of a pothouse, and—and and even admitting that he knew he had some of the essentials of a gentleman, what was there in that to be proud of? Everything ought to be a gentleman, and more than that. And all the same, he remembered, he too had done little things, not exactly dishonest, and yet—and what thoughts he sometimes had! Hm! And to set all that beside Avdotya Romanovna! Confound it! So be it! Well, he'd make a point, then, of being dirty, greasy, pothouse in his manners, and he wouldn't care. He'd be worse." He was engaged in such monologues when Zosimov, 
who had spent the night in Praskovia Pavlovna's parlour, came in. He was going home and was in a hurry to look at the invalid first. Razumian informed him that Raskolnikov was sleeping like a dormouse. Sosimov gave orders that they shouldn't wake him and promised to see him again about eleven. "'If he is still at home,' he added. "'Damn it all! If one can't control one's patients, how is one to cure them? Do you know whether he will go to them, or whether they are coming here?' "'They are coming, I think,' said Razumian, understanding the object of the question. "'And they will discuss their family affairs, no doubt. I'll be off. You, as the doctor, have more right to be there than I. But I am not a father-confessor. I shall come and go away. I've plenty to do besides looking after them." "'One thing worries me,' interposed Razumian, frowning. "'On the way home I talked a lot of drunken nonsense to him, all sorts of things, and amongst them that you were afraid that he might become insane. You told the lady so, too. I know it was stupid. You may beat me if you like. Did you think so seriously?" "'That's nonsense, I tell you. How could I think it seriously? You yourself described him as a monomaniac when you fetched me to him, and we added fuel to the fire yesterday, you did, that is, with your story about the painter. It was a nice conversation, when he was, perhaps, mad on that very point. If only I'd known what happened then at the police station and that some wretch had insulted him with this suspicion. Hm! I would not have allowed that conversation yesterday. These monomaniacs will make a mountain out of a molehill, and see their fancies as solid realities. As far as I remember, it was Zamatov's story that cleared up half the mystery to my mind. Why, I know one case in which a hypochondriac, a man of forty, cut the throat of a little boy of eight because he couldn't endure the jokes he made every day at table. And in this case, his rags, the insolent police officer, the fever, and this suspicion, all that working upon a man half frantic with hypochondria, and with his morbid exceptional vanity. That may well have been the starting point of illness. Well, bother it all. And by the way, that Zamatov certainly is a nice fellow, but, hm, he shouldn't have told all that last night. He is an awful chatterbox. But whom did he tell it to? You and me? And Porfiry. And what does that matter? And, by the way, have you any influence on them, his mother and sister? Tell them to be more careful with him today. They'll get on all right, Razumian answered reluctantly. Why is he so set against this illusion? A man with money, and she doesn't seem to dislike him. And they haven't a farthing, I suppose, eh?" "'But what business is it of yours?' Razumian cried with annoyance. "'How can I tell whether they've a farthing? Ask them yourself, and perhaps you'll find out.' "'Foo! What an ass you are sometimes! Last night's wine has not gone off yet. Good-bye. Thank your Praskovia Pavlovna from me for my night's lodging.' She locked herself in, made no reply to my bonjour through the door. She was up at seven o'clock. The samovar was taken into her from the kitchen. I was not vouchsafed a personal interview. At nine o'clock precisely, Razumian reached the lodgings at Bakaliev's house. Both ladies were waiting for him with nervous impatience. They had risen at seven o'clock or earlier. He entered looking as black as night, bowed awkwardly, and was at once furious with himself for it. He had reckoned without his host. Pulcheria Alexandrovna fairly rushed at him, seized him by both hands, and was almost kissing them. He glanced timidly at Avdotya Romanovna, but her proud countenance wore at that moment an expression of such gratitude and friendliness, such complete and unlooked-for respect, in place of the sneering looks and ill-disguised contempt he had expected, that it threw him into greater confusion than if he had been met with abuse. Fortunately, there was a subject for conversation, and he made haste to snatch at it. Hearing that everything was going well, and that Rodya had not yet waked, Pulcheria Alexandrovna declared that she was glad to hear it, because she had something which it was very, very necessary to talk over beforehand. Then followed an inquiry about breakfast, and an invitation to have it with them. They had waited to have it with him. 
Evdodya Romanovna rang the bell. It was answered by a ragged, dirty waiter, and they asked him to bring tea which was served at last, but in such a dirty and disorderly way that the ladies were ashamed. Razumihin vigorously attacked the lodgings, but remembering Luzhin, stopped in embarrassment and was greatly relieved by Pulcheria Alexandrovna's questions, which showered in a continual stream upon him. He talked for three-quarters of an hour, being constantly interrupted by their questions, and succeeded in describing to them all the most important facts he knew of the last year of Raskolnikov's life, concluding with a circumstantial account of his illness. He omitted, however, many things, which were better omitted, including the scene at the police station with all its consequences. They listened eagerly to his story, and when he thought he had finished and satisfied his listeners, he found that they considered he had hardly begun. "'Tell me, tell me, what do you think? Excuse me, I still don't know your name,' Pulcheria Alexandrovna put in hastily. "'Dmitri Prokovitch. I should like very, very much to know, Dmitri Prokovitch, how he looks, on things in general now, that is, how can I explain, what are his likes and dislikes? Is he always so irritable? Tell me, if you can, what are his hopes, and, so to speak, his dreams? Under what influences is he now? In a word, I should like—' "'Ah, mother, how can he answer all that at once?' observed Donya. "'Good heavens! I had not expected to find him in the least like this, Dmitri Prokovitch. "'Naturally,' answered Razumian. I have no mother, but my uncle comes every year, and almost every time he can scarcely recognize me, even in appearance, though he is a clever man, and your three years' separation means a great deal. What am I to tell you? I have known Rodian for a year and a half. He is morose, gloomy, proud, and haughty, and of late, and perhaps for a long time before, he has been suspicious and fanciful. He has a noble nature and a kind heart. He does not like showing his feelings, and would rather do a cruel thing than open his heart freely. Sometimes, though, he is not at all morbid, but simply cold and inhumanly callous. It's as though he were alternating between two characters. Sometimes he is fearfully reserved. He says he is so busy that everything is a hindrance, and yet he lies in bed doing nothing. He doesn't jeer at things, not because he hasn't the wit, but as though he hadn't time to waste on such trifles. He never listens to what is said to him. He is never interested in what interests other people at any given moment. He thinks very highly of himself, and perhaps he is right. Well, what more? I think your arrival will have a most beneficial influence upon him." "'God grant it may!' cried Pulcheria Alexandrovna, distressed by Razumian's account of her rodya. And Razumian ventured to look more boldly at Avdotya Romanovna at last. He glanced at her often while he was talking, but only for a moment and looked away again at once. Avdotya Romanovna sat at the table, listening attentively, then got up again and began walking to and fro with her arms folded and her lips compressed, occasionally putting in a question without stopping her walk. She had the same habit of not listening to what was said. She was wearing a dress of thin dark stuff, and she had a white transparent scarf round her neck. Razumian soon detected signs of extreme poverty in their belongings. Had Avdotya Romanovna been dressed like a queen, he felt that he would not be afraid of her. But perhaps just because she was poorly dressed and that he noticed all the misery of her surroundings, his heart was filled with dread and he began to be afraid of every word he uttered, every gesture he made which was very trying for a man who already felt diffident. "'You've told us a great deal that is interesting about my brother's character, and have told it impartially. I am glad. I thought that you were too uncritically devoted to him,' observed Avdotya Romanovna with a smile. "'I think you are right that he needs a woman's care,' she added thoughtfully. "'I didn't say so, but I dare say you are right. Only—' "'What?' He loves no one, and perhaps he never will," Brazumian declared decisively. "'You mean he is not capable of love?' "'Do you know, Avdotya Romanovna, you are awfully like your brother, in everything indeed,' he blurted out suddenly, to his own surprise. 
but remembering at once what he had just before said of her brother, he turned as red as a crab and was overcome with confusion. Avdotya Romanovna couldn't help laughing when she looked at him. "'You may both be mistaken about Rodya,' Pocheria Alexandrovna remarked, slightly piqued. "'I am not talking of our present difficulty, Donya. What Pyotr Petrovitch writes in his letter, and what you and I have supposed, may be mistaken, but you can't imagine, Dmitri Prokovitch, how moody and, so to say, capricious he is. I never could depend on what he would do when he was only fifteen and I am sure that he might do something now that nobody else would think of doing. Well, for instance, do you know how a year and a half ago he astounded me and gave me a shock that nearly killed me, when he had the idea of marrying that girl, what was her name, his landlady's daughter?" "'Did you hear about that affair?' asked Avdotya Romanovna. "'Do you suppose,' Pocheria Alexandrovna continued warmly, "'do you suppose that my tears, my entreaties, my illness, my possible death from grief, our poverty would have made him pause? No, he would calmly have disregarded all obstacles. And yet it isn't that he doesn't love us." "'He has never spoken a word of that affair to me,' Razumian answered cautiously. But I did hear something from Praskovia Pavlovna herself, though she is by no means a gossip and what I heard certainly was rather strange. "'And what did you hear?' both the ladies asked at once. "'Well, nothing very special. I only learned that the marriage, which only failed to take place through the girl's death, was not at all to Praskovia Pavlovna's liking. They say, too, the girl was not at all pretty, in fact, I am told, positively ugly. And such an invalid, and queer but she seems to have had some good qualities. She must have had some good qualities, or it's quite inexplicable. She had no money either, and he wouldn't have considered her money, but it's always difficult to judge in such matters." "'I am sure she was a good girl,' Evdotya Romanovna observed briefly. "'God forgive me, I simply rejoiced at her death, though I don't know which of them would have caused most misery to the other, he to her or she to him. Pulcheria Alexandrovna concluded. Then she began tentatively questioning him about the scene on the previous day with Luzhin, hesitating and continually glancing at Donya, obviously to the latter's annoyance. This incident more than all the rest evidently caused her uneasiness, even consternation. Razumian described it in detail again, but this time he added his own conclusions. He openly blamed Raskolnikov for intentionally insulting Pyotr Petrovitch, not seeking to excuse him on the score of his illness. He had planned it before his illness, he added. I think so, too, Polcheria Alexandrovna agreed with a dejected air. But she was very much surprised at hearing Razumian express himself so carefully, and even with a certain respect about Pyotr Petrovitch. Avdotya Romanovna, too, was struck by it. So this is your opinion of Pyotr Petrovitch? Pulcheria Alexandrovna could not resist asking. I can have no other opinion of your daughter's future husband, Razumian answered firmly and with warmth. And I don't say it simply from vulgar politeness, but because, simply because, Avdotya Romanovna has of her own free will deigned to accept this man. If I spoke so rudely of him last night, it was because I was disgustingly drunk, and mad besides. Yes, mad, crazy. I lost my head completely. And this morning I am ashamed of it." He crimsoned and ceased speaking. Avdotya Romanovna flushed, but did not break the silence. She had not uttered a word from the moment they began to speak of illusion. Without her support, Pulcheria Alexandrovna obviously did not know what to do. At last, faltering and continually glancing at her daughter, she confessed that she was exceedingly worried by one circumstance. "'You see, Dmitri Prokovitch,' she began, "'I'll be perfectly open with Dmitri Prokovitch, Donya. "'Of course, mother,' said Avdotya Romanovna emphatically. "'This is what it is,' she began in haste, as though the permission to speak of her trouble lifted a weight off her mind. "'Very early this morning, 
we got a note from Pyotr Petrovitch in reply to our letter announcing our arrival. He promised to meet us at the station, you know. Instead of that, he sent a servant to bring us the address of these lodgings, and to show us the way. And he sent a message that he would be there himself this morning. But this morning this note came from him. You'd better read it yourself. There is one point in it which worries me very much. You will soon see what that is, and... Tell me your candid opinion, Dmitri Prokovitch. You know Rodia's character better than anyone, and no one can advise us better than you can. Donya, I must tell you, made her decision at once. But I still don't feel sure how to act, and I... I've been waiting for your opinion." Razumian opened the note, which was dated the previous evening, and read as follows. Dear Madam Polcheria Alexandrovna, I have the honor to inform you that, owing to unforeseen obstacles, I was rendered unable to meet you at the railway station. I sent a very competent person with the same object in view. I likewise shall be deprived of the honor of an interview with you tomorrow morning by business in the Senate that does not admit of delay, and also that I may not intrude on your family circle while you are meeting your son, and Avdotya Romanovna, her brother. I shall have the honor of visiting you and paying you my respects at your lodgings not later than tomorrow evening at eight o'clock precisely, and herewith I venture to present my earnest and, I may add, imperative request that Rodion Romanovitch may not be present at our interview, as he offered me a gross and unprecedented affront on the occasion of my visit to him in his illness yesterday. And, moreover, since I desire from you, personally, an indispensable and circumstantial explanation upon a certain point, in regard to which I wish to learn your own interpretation. I have the honor to inform you, in anticipation, that if, in spite of my request, I meet Rodion Romanovitch, I shall be compelled to withdraw immediately, and then you have only yourself to blame. I write on the assumption that Rodion Romanovitch, who appeared so ill at my visit, suddenly recovered two hours later and so, being able to leave the house, may visit you also. I was confirmed in that belief by the testimony of my own eyes in the lodging of a drunken man who was run over and has since died, to whose daughter, a young woman of notorious behavior, he gave twenty-five roubles on the pretext of the funeral, which gravely surprised me, knowing what pains you were at to raise that sum. Herewith expressing my special respect to your estimable daughter, Avdotya Romanovna, I beg you to accept the respectful homage of your humble servant, P. Luzhin. "'What am I to do now, Dmitri Prokovitch?' began Polcheria Alexandrovna, almost weeping. "'How can I ask Rodya not to come? Yesterday he insisted so earnestly on our refusing Pyotr Petrovitch, and now we are ordered not to receive Rodya.' He will come on purpose if he knows, and what will happen then?" "'Act on Avdotya Romanovna's decision,' Razumian answered calmly at once. "'Oh, dear me! She says—goodness knows what she says—she doesn't explain her object. She says that it would be best—at least not that it would be best, but that it's absolutely necessary that Rodya should make a point of being here at eight o'clock and that they must meet. I didn't want even to show him the letter, but to prevent him from coming by some stratagem with your help, because he is so irritable. Besides, I don't understand about that drunkard who died, and that daughter, and how he could have given the daughter all the money, which—' "'Which cost you such sacrifice, mother,' put in Avdotya Romanovna. "'He was not himself yesterday,' Razumian said thoughtfully. If you only knew what he was up to in a restaurant yesterday, though there was sense in it, too. Hm. He did say something, as we were going home yesterday evening, about a dead man and a girl, but I didn't understand a word. But last night, I myself— The best thing, mother, will be for us to go to him ourselves, and there, I assure you, we will see at once what's to be done. Besides, it's getting late. Good heavens, it's past ten! she cried, looking at a splendid gold enameled watch which hung round her neck on a thin Venetian chain, and looked entirely out of keeping with the rest of her dress. A present from her fiancé, thought Razumian. 
We must start, Donya, we must start," her mother cried in a flutter. He will be thinking we are still angry after yesterday, from our coming so late. Merciful heavens!" While she said this, she was hurriedly putting on her hat and mantle. Donya too put on her things. Her gloves, as Razumia noticed, were not merely shabby, but had holes in them, and yet this evident poverty gave the two ladies an air of special dignity, which is always found in people who know how to wear poor clothes. Razumian looked reverently at Donia and felt proud of escorting her. The queen who mended her stockings in prison, he thought, must have looked then every inch a queen and even more a queen than at sumptuous banquets and levees. "'My God!' exclaimed Pulcheria Alexandrovna. "'Little did I think that I should ever fear seeing my son, my darling, darling Rodya. I am afraid, Dmitri Prokovitch,' she added, glancing at him timidly. "'Don't be afraid, mother,' said Donya, kissing her. "'Better have faith in him.' "'Oh, dear, I have faith in him, but I haven't slept all night!' exclaimed the poor woman. They came out into the street. "'Do you know, Donya, when I dozed a little this morning I dreamed of Marfa Petrovna. She was all in white. She came up to me, took my hand, and shook her head at me, but so sternly as though she were blaming me. Is that a good omen? Oh, dear me! You don't know, Dmitri Prokovitch, that Marfa Petrovna's dead." No, I didn't know. Who is Marfa Petrovna? She died suddenly, and only fancy— Afterwards, Mama, put in Donya, he doesn't know who Marfa Petrovna is. Ah, you don't know? And I was thinking that you knew all about us. Forgive me, Dmitri Prokovitch, I don't know what I am thinking about these last few days. I look upon you really as a providence for us, and so I took it for granted that you knew all about us. I look on you as a relation. Don't be angry with me for saying so. Dear me, what's the matter with your right hand? Have you knocked it?" "'Yes, I bruised it,' muttered Razumian, overjoyed. "'I sometimes speak too much from the heart, so that Donya finds fault with me. But dear me, what a cupboard he lives in! I wonder whether he is awake. Does this woman, this landlady, consider it a room? Listen, you say he does not like to show his feelings, so perhaps I shall annoy him with my weaknesses? Do advise me, Dmitri Prokovitch, how am I to treat him? I feel quite distracted, you know." Don't question him too much about anything if you see him frown. Don't ask him too much about his health, he doesn't like that. Ah, Dmitri Prokovitch, how hard it is to be a mother! But here are the stairs. What an awful staircase! Mother, you are quite pale, don't distress yourself, darling," said Donya, caressing her. Then, with flashing eyes, she added, "'He ought to be happy at seeing you, and you are tormenting yourself so.' "'Wait, I'll peep in and see whether he has waked up.' The lady slowly followed Razumian, who went on before and when they reached the landlady's door in the fourth story, they noticed that her door was a tiny crack open and that two keen black eyes were watching them from the darkness within. When their eyes met, the door was suddenly shut with such a slam that Pulcheria Alexandrovna almost cried out. End of Part 3, Chapter 2 Part 3, Chapter 3 He is well, quite well. Sosimov cried cheerfully as they entered. He had come in ten minutes earlier and was sitting in the same place as before on the sofa. Raskolnikov was sitting in the opposite corner, fully dressed and carefully washed and combed, as he had not been for some time past. The room was immediately crowded, yet Nastasya managed to follow the visitors in and stayed to listen. Raskolnikov really was almost well, as compared with his condition the day before but he was still pale, listless, and somber. He looked like a wounded man or one who has undergone some terrible physical suffering. His brows were knitted, his lips compressed, his eyes feverish. He spoke little and reluctantly, as though performing a duty, and there was a restlessness in his movements. He only wanted a sling on his arm or a bandage on his finger to complete the impression of a man with a painful abscess or a broken arm. 
The pale, somber face lighted up for a moment when his mother and sister entered, but this only gave it a look of more intense suffering, in place of its listless dejection. The light soon died away, but the look of suffering remained, and Zosimov, watching and studying his patient with all the zest of a young doctor beginning to practice, noticed in him no joy at the arrival of his mother and sister but a sort of bitter, hidden determination to bear another hour or two of inevitable torture. He saw later that almost every word of the following conversation seemed to touch on some sore place and irritate it. But at the same time he marveled at the power of controlling himself, and hiding his feelings in a patient who the previous day had, like a monomaniac, fallen into a frenzy at the slightest word. Yes, I see myself now that I am almost well," said Raskolnikov, giving his mother and sister a kiss of welcome which made Pulcheria Alexandrovna radiant at once. And I don't say this as I did yesterday," he said, addressing Razumihin, with a friendly pressure of his hand. Yes, indeed, I am quite surprised at him today," began Zosimov, much delighted at the lady's entrance for he had not succeeded in keeping up a conversation with his patient for ten minutes. In another three or four days, if he goes on like this, he will be just as before, that is, as he was a month ago, or two, or perhaps even three. This has been coming on for a long while, eh? Confess now that it has been perhaps your own fault," he added with a tentative smile, as though still afraid of irritating him. It is very possible answered Raskolnikov coldly. "'I should say so, too,' continued Zosimov with zest, "'that your complete recovery depends solely on yourself. Now that one can talk to you, I should like to impress upon you that it is essential to avoid the elementary, so to speak, fundamental causes tending to produce your morbid condition. In that case you will be cured. If not, it will go from bad to worse. These fundamental causes I don't know but they must be known to you. You are an intelligent man, and must have observed yourself, of course. I fancy the first stage of your derangement coincides with your leaving the university. You must not be left without occupation, and so work and a definite aim set before you might, I fancy, be very beneficial. Yes, yes, you are perfectly right. I will make haste and return to the university and then everything will go smoothly." Zosimov, who had begun his sage advice partly to make an effect before the ladies, was certainly somewhat mystified, when, glancing at his patient, he observed unmistakable mockery on his face. This lasted an instant, however. Pulcheria Alexandrovna began at once thanking Zosimov, especially for his visit to their lodging the previous night. "'What? He saw you last night? Raskolnikov asked, as though startled. Then you have not slept either after your journey. Ah, Rodya, that was only till two o'clock. Donya and I never go to bed before two at home. I don't know how to thank him either, Raskolnikov went on, suddenly frowning and looking down. Setting aside the question of payment, forgive me for referring to it, he turned to Zosimov. I really don't know what I have done to deserve such special attention from you. I simply don't understand it. And, and, it weighs upon me, indeed, because I don't understand it. I tell you so candidly." Don't be irritated, Zosimov forced himself to laugh. Assume that you are my first patient. Well, we fellows just beginning to practice love our first patients as if they were our children, and some almost fall in love with them and, of course, I am not rich in patience." "'I say nothing about him,' added Raskolnikov, pointing to Razumihin, though he has had nothing from me either but insult and trouble. "'What nonsense he is talking! Why, you are in a sentimental mood today, are you?' shouted Razumihin. If he had had more penetration, he would have seen that there was no trace of sentimentality in him, but something indeed quite the opposite but Avdotya Romanovia noticed it. She was intently and uneasily watching her brother. "'As for you, mother, I don't dare to speak,' he went on, as though repeating a lesson learned by heart. 
it is only today that I have been able to realize a little how distressed you must have been here yesterday, waiting for me to come back." When he had said this, he suddenly held out his hand to his sister, smiling without a word. But in this smile there was a flash of real unfeigned feeling. Donia caught it at once, and warmly pressed his hand, overjoyed and thankful. It was the first time he had addressed her since their dispute the previous day. The mother's face lighted up with ecstatic happiness at the sight of this conclusive unspoken reconciliation. Yes, that is what I love him for, Razumian, exaggerating it all, muttered to himself, with a vigorous turn in his chair. He has these movements. And how well he does it all, the mother was thinking to herself. What generous impulses he has, and how simply, how delicately he put an end to all the misunderstanding with his sister, simply by holding out his hand at the right minute and looking at her like that. And what fine eyes he has, and how fine his whole face is! He is even better looking than Donia. But, good heavens, what a suit! How terribly he's dressed! Vasya, the messenger boy in Afanasy Ivanitch's shop, is better dressed. I could rush at him and hug him, weep over him, but I am afraid. Oh, dear, he's so strange! He's talking kindly, but I am afraid. Why, what am I afraid of?" Oh, Rodya, you wouldn't believe, she began suddenly, in haste to answer his words to her, how unhappy Donia and I were yesterday. Now that it's all over and done with, we are quite happy again, I can tell you. Fancy, we ran here almost straight from the train to embrace you, and that woman—ah, here she is. Good morning, Nastasia. She told us at once that you were lying in a high fever and had just run away from the doctor in delirium, and they were looking for you in the streets. You can't imagine how we felt. I couldn't help thinking of the tragic end of Lieutenant Potenchikov, a friend of your father's—you can't remember him, Rodya who ran out in the same way in a high fever and fell into the well in the courtyard, and they couldn't pull him out till the next day. Of course, we exaggerated things. We were on the point of rushing to find Pyotr Petrovitch to ask him to help, because we were alone, utterly alone," she said plaintively, and stopped short, suddenly, recollecting it was still somewhat dangerous to speak of Pyotr Petrovitch, although we are quite happy again. Yes, yes, of course, it's very annoying," Raskolnikov muttered in reply, but with such a preoccupied and inattentive air that Donia gazed at him in perplexity. What else was it I wanted to say? He went on trying to recollect. Oh, yes, mother, and you too, Donia, please don't think that I didn't mean to come and see you today and was waiting for you to come first. What are you saying, Rodya? cried Pocheria Alexandrovna. She, too, was surprised. "'Is he answering us as a duty?' Donia wondered. "'Is he being reconciled and asking forgiveness as though he were performing a rite or repeating a lesson?' "'I've only just waked up and wanted to go to you, but was delayed owing to my clothes. I forgot yesterday to ask her, Nastasia, to wash out the blood. I've only just dressed.' "'Blood? What blood?" Polcheria Alexandrovna asked in alarm. Oh, nothing. Don't be uneasy. It was when I was wandering about yesterday, rather delirious, I chanced upon a man who had been run over, a clerk. Delirious? But you remember everything, Razumian interrupted. That's true, Raskolnikov answered with special carefulness. I remember everything, even to the slightest detail, and yet why I did that, and went there and said that, I can't clearly explain now." "'A familiar phenomenon,' interposed Zosimov. Actions are sometimes performed in a masterly and most cunning way, while the direction of the actions is deranged and dependent on various morbid impressions. It's like a dream.' "'Perhaps it's a good thing, really, that he should think me almost a madman,' thought Raskolnikov. Why, people in perfect health act in the same way, too," observed Donia, looking uneasily at Zosimov. "'There is some truth in your observation,' the latter replied. 
In that sense, we are certainly all not infrequently like madmen, but with the slight difference that the deranged are somewhat madder, for we must draw a line. A normal man, it is true, hardly exists. Among dozens, perhaps hundreds of thousands, hardly one is to be met with." At the word madman, carelessly dropped by Zosimov in his chatter on his favorite subject, everyone frowned. Raskolnikov sat seeming not to pay attention, plunged in thought with a strange smile on his pale lips. He was still meditating on something. "'Well, what about the man who was run over? I interrupted you,' Razumian cried hastily. "'What?' Raskolnikov seemed to wake up. "'Oh, I got spattered with blood helping to carry him to his lodging. By the way, Mama, I did an unpardonable thing yesterday. I was literally out of my mind. I gave away all the money you sent me, to his wife for the funeral. She's a widow now, in consumption, a poor creature. Three little children, starving, nothing in the house. There's a daughter, too. Perhaps you'd have given it yourself if you'd seen them. But I had no right to do it, I admit, especially as I knew how you needed the money yourself. To help others, one must have the right to do it, or else crevez, charme, si vous n'êtes pas contente. He laughed. That's right, isn't it, Donia? No, it's not, answered Donia firmly. Bah, you too have ideals, he muttered, looking at her almost with hatred, and smiling sarcastically. I ought to have considered that. Well, that's praiseworthy, and it's better for you, and if you reach a line you won't overstep, you will be unhappy, and if you overstep it, maybe you will be still unhappier. But all that's nonsense," he added irritably, vexed at being carried away. I only meant to say that I beg your forgiveness, mother," he concluded, shortly and abruptly. That's enough, Rodya. I am sure that everything you do is very good," said his mother, delighted. "'Don't be too sure,' he answered, twisting his mouth into a smile. A silence followed. There was a certain constraint in all this conversation, and in the silence, and in the reconciliation, and in the forgiveness, and all were feeling it. "'It is as though they were afraid of me,' Raskolnikov was thinking to himself, looking askance at his mother and sister. Pulcheria Alexandrovna was indeed growing more timid the longer she kept silent. "'Yet in their absence I seem to love them so much,' flashed through his mind. "'Do you know, Rodya, Marfa Petrovna is dead?' Pulcheria Alexandrovna suddenly blurted out. "'What, Marfa Petrovna?' "'Oh, mercy on us! Marfa Petrovna Svidrigailov! I wrote you so much about her!' Ah, yes, I remember. So, she's dead. Oh, really? He roused himself up suddenly, as if waking up. What did she die of? Only imagine, quite suddenly, Pulcheria Alexandrovna answered hurriedly, encouraged by his curiosity. On the very day I was sending you that letter, would you believe it, that awful man seems to have been the cause of her death. They say he beat her dreadfully. Why, were they on such bad terms?" he asked, addressing his sister. Not at all. Quite the contrary, indeed. With her he was always very patient, considerate even. In fact, all those seven years of their married life he gave way to her, too much so indeed, in many cases. All of a sudden he seems to have lost patience. Then he could not have been so awful if he controlled himself for seven years. You seem to be defending him, don't you? Oh, no, no, he's an awful man. I can imagine nothing more awful," Donya answered, almost with a shudder, knitting her brows and sinking into thought. That had happened in the morning," Pulcheria Alexandrovna went on hurriedly. And directly afterwards she ordered the horses to be harnessed, to drive to the town immediately after dinner. She always used to drive to the town in such cases. She ate a very good dinner, I am told. After the beating? That was always her habit. And immediately after dinner, so as not to be late in starting, she went to the bathhouse. You see, she was undergoing some treatment with baths. 
they have a cold spring there, and she used to bathe in it regularly every day, and no sooner had she got into the water when she suddenly had a stroke." "'I should think so,' said Zosimov. "'And did he beat her badly?' "'What does that matter?' put in Donia. "'Hm! But I don't know why you want to tell us such gossip, mother.' said Raskolnikov irritably, as it were in spite of himself. "'Ah, my dear, I don't know what to talk about,' broke from Polcheria Alexandrovna. "'Why, are you all afraid of me?' he asked with a constrained smile. "'That's certainly true,' said Donia, looking directly and sternly at her brother. Mother was crossing herself with terror as she came up the stairs. His face worked, as though in convulsion. Ah, what are you saying, Donia? Don't be angry, please, Rodya. Why did you say that, Donia? Polcheria Alexandrovna began, overwhelmed. You see, coming here, I was dreaming all the way, in the train, how we should meet, how we should talk over everything together, and I was so happy, I did not notice the journey. But what am I saying? I am happy now. You should not, Donia. I am happy now, simply in seeing you, Rodya. Hush, mother," he muttered in confusion, not looking at her, but pressing her hand. We shall have time to speak freely of everything. As he said this, he was suddenly overwhelmed with confusion and turned pale. Again that awful sensation he had known of late passed with deadly chill over his soul. Again it became suddenly plain and perceptible to him that he had just told a fearful lie that he would never now be able to speak freely of everything, that he would never again be able to speak of anything to anyone. The anguish of this thought was such that for a moment he almost forgot himself. He got up from his seat, and not looking at anyone, walked towards the door. "'What are you about?' cried Razumian, clutching him by the arm. He sat down again and began looking about him in silence. They were all looking at him in perplexity. "'But what are you all so dull for?' he shouted, suddenly and quite unexpectedly. "'Do say something! What's the use of sitting like this? Come, do speak! Let us talk! We meet together and sit in silence! Come, anything!' "'Thank God! I was afraid the same thing as yesterday was beginning again,' said Pulcheria Alexandrovna, crossing herself. "'What is the matter, Rodya?' asked Avdotya Romanovna distrustfully. "'Oh, nothing. I remembered something,' he answered, and suddenly laughed. "'Well, if you remembered something, that's all right. I was beginning to think,' muttered Zosimov, getting up from the sofa. "'It is time for me to be off. I will look in again, perhaps, if I can.' He made his bows and went out. What an excellent man!" observed Polcheria Alexandrovna. Yes, excellent, splendid, well-educated, intelligent," Raskolnikov began, suddenly speaking with surprising rapidity, and a liveliness he had not shown till then. I can't remember where I met him before my illness. I believe I have met him somewhere. And this is a good man, too," he nodded at Razumian. Do you like him, Donia? he asked her and suddenly, for some unknown reason, laughed. "'Very much,' answered Donia. "'Foo! What a pig you are!' Razumian protested, blushing in terrible confusion, and he got up from his chair. Pulcheria Alexandrovna smiled faintly, but Raskolnikov laughed aloud. "'Where are you off to?' "'I must go.' "'You need not at all. Stay! Zosimov has gone, so you must. Don't go. What's the time? Is it twelve o'clock? What a pretty watch you have got, Donia! But why are you all silent again? I do all the talking." "'It was a present from Marfa Petrovna,' answered Donia. "'And a very expensive one,' added Pulcheria Alexandrovna. "'Ah! What a big one! Hardly like a lady's!' "'I like that sort,' said Donia. So. It is not a present from her fiancé," thought Razumian, and was unreasonably delighted. "'I thought it was Luzhin's present,' observed Raskolnikov. 
No, he has not made Doña any presents yet. Ah! And do you remember, mother, I was in love and wanted to get married? He said suddenly, looking at his mother, who was disconcerted by the sudden change of subject and the way he spoke of it. Oh, yes, my dear. Pulcheria Alexandrovna exchanged glances with Doña and Resumian. Hm, yes. What shall I tell you? I don't remember much indeed. She was such a sickly girl, he went on, growing dreamy and looking down again. Quite an invalid. She was fond of giving alms to the poor and was always dreaming of a nunnery, and once she burst into tears when she began talking to me about it. Yes, yes, I remember. I remember very well. She was an ugly little thing. I really don't know what drew me to her then. I think it was because she was always ill. If she had been lame or hunchback, I believe I should have liked her better still." He smiled dreamily. Yes, it was a sort of spring delirium. No, it was not only spring delirium, said Doña with warm feeling. He fixed a strained intent look on his sister, but did not hear or did not understand her words. Then, completely lost in thought, he got up, went up to his mother, kissed her, went back to his place and sat down. "'You love her even now?' said Pulcheria Alexandrovna, touched. "'Her? Now? Oh, yes, you ask about her. No. That's all now, as it were, in another world. And so long ago. And, indeed, everything happening here seems somehow far away.' He looked attentively at them. You now, I seem to be looking at you from a thousand miles away. But goodness knows why we are talking of that. And what's the use of asking about it?" He added with annoyance, and biting his nails, fell into dreamy silence again. "'What a wretched lodging you have, Rodya! It's like a tomb,' said Pulcheria Alexandrovna, suddenly breaking the oppressive silence. "'I am sure it's quite half through your lodging you have become so melancholy. My lodging," he answered listlessly. Yes, the lodging had a great deal to do with it. I thought that, too. If only you knew, though, what a strange thing you said just now, mother," he said, laughing strangely. A little more, and their companionship, this mother and this sister, with him after three years' absence, this intimate tone of conversation in face of the utter impossibility of really speaking about anything would have been beyond his power of endurance. But there was one urgent matter which must be settled one way or the other that day, so he had decided when he woke. Now he was glad to remember it, as a means of escape. "'Listen, Doña," he began gravely and dryly, "'of course I beg your pardon for yesterday, but I consider it my duty to tell you again that I do not withdraw my chief point. It is me or Lusion. If I am a scoundrel, you must not be. One is enough. If you marry Lusion, I cease at once to look on you as a sister." "'Rodya! Rodya! It is the same as yesterday again!' Pulcheria Alexandrovna cried mournfully. "'And why do you call yourself a scoundrel? I can't bear it. You said the same yesterday.' "'Brother,' Doña answered firmly and with the same dryness. In all this there is a mistake on your part. I thought it over at night, and found out the mistake. It is all because you seem to fancy I am sacrificing myself to someone and for someone. That is not the case at all. I am simply marrying for my own sake, because things are hard for me. Though, of course, I shall be glad if I succeed in being useful to my family. But that is not the chief motive for my decision." She is lying he thought to himself, biting his nails vindictively. Proud creature! She won't admit she wants to do it out of charity. Too haughty! Oh, base characters! They even love as though they hate. Oh, how I hate them all!" "'In fact,' continued Doña, "'I am marrying Pyotr Petrovitch because of two evils I choose the less. I intend to do honestly all he expects of me so I am not deceiving him. Why did you smile just now? 
She, too, flushed, and there was a gleam of anger in her eyes. "'All?' he asked with a malignant grin. "'Within certain limits. Both the manner and form of Pyotr Petrovitch's courtship showed me at once what he wanted. He may, of course, think too well of himself, but I hope he esteems me too. Why are you laughing again? And why are you blushing again? You are lying, sister. You are intentionally lying, simply from feminine obstinacy, simply to hold your own against me. You cannot respect Lusian. I have seen him and talked with him. So you are selling yourself for money, and so in any case you are acting basely, and I am glad at least that you can blush for it." "'It is not true. I am not lying,' cried Dona, losing her composure. "'I would not marry him if I were not convinced that he esteems me and thinks highly of me. I would not marry him if I were not firmly convinced that I can respect him. Fortunately, I can have convincing proof of it this very day, and such a marriage is not a vileness, as you say. And even if you were right, if I really had determined on a vile action, is it not merciless on your part to speak to me like that? Why do you demand of me a heroism that perhaps you have not either? It is despotism. It is tyranny. If I ruin anyone, it is only myself. I am not committing a murder. Why do you look at me like that? Why are you so pale? Rodya, darling, what's the matter?" "'Good heavens, you have made him faint!' cried Polcheria Alexandrovna. "'No, no, nonsense. It's nothing. A little giddiness. Not fainting. You have fainting on the brain. Hm. Yes. What was I saying? Oh, yes. In what way will you get convincing proof today that you can respect him and that he esteems you, as you said? I think you said today?" "'Mother, show Rodya Pyotr Petrovitch's letter,' said Dona. With trembling hands Polcheria Alexandrovna gave him the letter. He took it with great interest, but before opening it he suddenly looked with a sort of wonder at Dona. "'It is strange,' he said slowly, as though struck by a new idea. "'What am I making such a fuss for? What is it all about?' marry whom you like." He said this as though to himself, but said it aloud, and looked for some time at his sister, as though puzzled. He opened the letter at last, still with the same look of strange wonder on his face. Then slowly and attentively he began reading, and read it through twice. Polcheria Alexandrovna showed marked anxiety, and all indeed expected something particular. What surprises me, he began, after a short pause, handing the letter to his mother but not addressing anyone in particular, is that he is a business man, a lawyer, and his conversation is pretentious indeed. And yet he writes such an uneducated letter. They all started. They had expected something quite different. But they all write like that, you know, Resuming observed abruptly. Have you read it? Yes. We showed him Rodya. We consulted him just now," Pulcheria Alexandrovna began, embarrassed. That's just the jargon of the courts, Brazumian put in. Legal documents are written like that to this day. Legal? Yes, it's just legal. Business language. Not so very uneducated, and not quite educated. Business language. Pyotr Petrovitch makes no secret of the fact that he had a cheap education. He is proud indeed of having made his own way," Avdotya Romanovna observed, somewhat offended by her brother's tone. "'Well, if he's proud of it, he has reason. I don't deny it. You seem to be offended, sister, at my making only such a frivolous criticism on the letter, and to think that I speak of such trifling matters on purpose to annoy you. It is quite the contrary. An observation apropos of the style occurred to me that is by no means irrelevant as things stand. There is one expression, blame yourselves, put in very significantly and plainly, and there is besides a threat that he will go away at once if I am present. That threat to go away is equivalent to a threat to abandon you both if you are disobedient, 
and to abandon you now after summoning you to Petersburg. Well, what do you think? Can one resent such an expression from Lusian as we should if he, he pointed to Razumian, had written it, or Zosimov, or one of us? No, answered Donia with more animation. I saw clearly that it was too naively expressed, and that perhaps he simply has no skill in writing. That is a true criticism, brother. I did not expect, indeed. It is expressed in legal style, and sounds coarser than perhaps he intended. But I must disillusion you a little. There is one expression in the letter, one slander about me, and a rather contemptible one. I gave the money last night to the widow, a woman in consumption, crushed with trouble, and not on the pretext of the funeral, but simply to pay for the funeral, and not to the daughter, a young woman, as he writes, of notorious behavior, whom I saw last night for the first time in my life, but to the widow. In all this I see a too hasty desire to slander me and to raise dissension between us. It is expressed again in legal jargon, that is to say, with a too obvious display of the aim, and with a very naive eagerness. He is a man of intelligence, but to act sensibly intelligence is not enough. It all shows the man, and I don't think he has a great esteem for you. I tell you this simply to warn you, because I sincerely wish for your good." Donia did not reply. Her resolution had been taken. She was only awaiting the evening. "'Then what is your decision, Rodya?' asked Pulcheria Alexandrovna, who was more uneasy than ever at the sudden, new business-like tone of his talk. What decision? You see, Pyotr Petrovitch writes that you are not to be with us this evening, and that he will go away if you come. So will you come? That, of course, is not for me to decide, but for you, first, if you are not offended by such a request, and secondly, by Donia, if she too is not offended. I will do what you think best," he added dryly. Donia has already decided, and I fully agree with her," Pulcheria Alexandrovna hastened to declare. I decided to ask you, Rodya, to urge you not to fail to be with us at this interview," said Donia. Will you come? Yes. I will ask you, too, to be with us at eight o'clock," she said, addressing Razumian. Mother, I am inviting him, too. Quite right, Donia. Well, since you have decided," added Pulcheria Alexandrovna, so be it. I shall feel easier myself. I do not like concealment and deception. Better let us have the whole truth. Pyotr Petrovitch may be angry or not now. End of Part 3, Chapter 3 Part 3, Chapter 4 At that moment the door was softly opened and a young girl walked into the room, looking timidly about her. Everyone turned towards her with surprise and curiosity. At first sight Raskolnikov did not recognize her. It was Sofia Semyonovna Marmeladov. He had seen her yesterday for the first time but at such a moment, in such surroundings and in such a dress, that his memory retained a very different image of her. Now she was a modestly and poorly dressed young girl, very young indeed, almost like a child, with a modest and refined manner, with a candid but somewhat frightened-looking face. She was wearing a very plain indoor dress, and had on a shabby, old-fashioned hat, but she still carried a parasol. Unexpectedly finding the room full of people, she was not so much embarrassed as completely overwhelmed with shyness, like a little child. She was even about to retreat. "'Oh, it's you,' said Raskolnikov, extremely astonished, and he too was confused. He at once recollected that his mother and sister knew through Lusian's letter of some young woman of notorious behavior. He had only just been protesting against Lusian's calumny and declaring that he had seen the girl last night for the first time, and suddenly she had walked in. He remembered, too, that he had not protested against the expression of notorious behavior. All this passed vaguely and fleetingly through his brain, 
but looking at her more intently, he saw that the humiliated creature was so humiliated that he felt suddenly sorry for her. When she made a movement to retreat in terror, it sent a pang to his heart. "'I did not expect you,' he said hurriedly, with a look that made her stop. "'Please, sit down. You come, no doubt, from Katerina Ivanovna. Allow me. Not there. Sit here.' At Sonia's entrance, Razumian, who had been sitting on one of Raskolnikov's three chairs, close to the door, got up to allow her to enter. Raskolnikov had at first shown her the place on the sofa where Zosimov had been sitting, but feeling that the sofa which served him as a bed was too familiar a place, he hurriedly motioned her to Razumian's chair. "'You sit here,' he said to Razumian, putting him on the sofa. Sonia sat down, almost shaking with terror and looked timidly at the two ladies. It was evidently almost inconceivable to herself that she could sit down beside them. At the thought of it, she was so frightened that she hurriedly got up again, and in utter confusion addressed Raskolnikov. "'I... I... have come for one minute. Forgive me for disturbing you,' she began falteringly. "'I come from Katerina Ivanovna, and she had no one to send. Katerina Ivanovna told me to beg you to be at the service in the morning at Mitrofanevsky, and then to us, to her, to do her the honor, she told me to beg you. Sonia stammered and ceased speaking. I will try, certainly, most certainly, answered Raskolnikov. He too stood up, and he too faltered and could not finish his sentence. Please sit down he said suddenly. I want to talk to you. You are perhaps in a hurry, but please, be so kind, spare me two minutes." And he drew up a chair for her. Sonia sat down again, and again timidly she took a hurried, frightened look at the two ladies, and dropped her eyes. Raskolnikov's pale face flushed, a shudder passed over him, his eyes glowed. "'Mother,' he said firmly and insistently, this is Sofia Semyonovna Marmeladov, the daughter of that unfortunate Mr. Marmeladov who was run over yesterday before my eyes, and of whom I was just telling you." Pulcheria Alexandrovna glanced at Sonia, and slightly screwed up her eyes. In spite of her embarrassment before Rodya's urgent and challenging look, she could not deny herself that satisfaction. Donya gazed gravely and intently into the poor girl's face and scrutinized her with perplexity. Sonia, hearing herself introduced, tried to raise her eyes again, but was more embarrassed than ever. "'I wanted to ask you,' said Raskolnikov hastily, "'how things were arranged yesterday. You were not worried by the police, for instance?' "'No, that was all right. It was too evident, the cause of death. They did not worry us. Only the lodgers were angry.' "'Why?' at the bodies remaining so long. You see, it is hot now, so that to-day they will carry it to the cemetery, into the chapel, until to-morrow. At first Katerina Ivanovna was unwilling, but now she sees herself that it is necessary. To-day, then? She begs you to do us the honor to be in the church to-morrow for the service, and then to be present at the funeral lunch. She is giving a funeral lunch? Yes, just a little. She told me to thank you very much for helping us yesterday. But for you we should have had nothing for the funeral." All at once her lips and chin began trembling, but with an effort she controlled herself, looking down again. During the conversation Raskolnikov watched her carefully. She had a thin, very thin, pale little face, rather irregular and angular, with sharp little nose and chin. She could not have been called pretty but her blue eyes were so clear, and when they lighted up there was such a kindliness and simplicity in her expression that one could not help being attracted. Her face, and her whole figure indeed, had another peculiar characteristic. In spite of her eighteen years she looked almost a little girl, almost a child. And in some of her gestures this childishness seemed almost absurd. But has Katerina Ivanovna been able to manage with such small means? Does she even mean to have a funeral lunch?" Raskolnikov asked, 
persistently keeping up the conversation. "'The coffin will be plain, of course, and everything will be plain, so it won't cost much. Katerina Ivanovna and I have reckoned it all out, so that there will be enough left, and Katerina Ivanovna was very anxious it should be so. You know one can't. It's a comfort to her. She is like that, you know. I understand, I understand, of course. Why do you look at my room like that? My mother has just said it was like a tomb." "'You gave us everything yesterday,' Sonia said suddenly in reply, in a loud, rapid whisper, and again she looked down in confusion. Her lips and chin were trembling once more. She had been struck at once by Raskolnikov's poor surroundings, and now these words broke out spontaneously. A silence followed. There was a light in Donya's eyes, and even Pulcheria Alexandrovna looked kindly at Sonia. Rodya, she said, getting up, we shall have dinner together, of course. Come, Donya, and you, Rodya, had better go for a little walk, and then rest and lie down before you come to see us. I am afraid we have exhausted you. Yes, yes, I'll come, he answered, getting up fussily. But I have something to see to. "'But surely you'll have dinner together?' cried Razumian, looking in surprise at Raskolnikov. "'What do you mean?' "'Yes, yes, I am coming, of course, of course. And you stay a minute. You do not want him just now, do you, mother? Or perhaps I am taking him from you.' "'Oh, no, no. And will you, Dmitri Prokovitch, do us the favour of dining with us?' "'Please do,' added Donya. Razumian bowed, positively radiant. For one moment they were all strangely embarrassed. Goodbye, Rodya, that is, till we meet. I do not like saying goodbye. Goodbye, Nastasya. Ah, I have said goodbye again. Pulcheria Alexandrovna meant to greet Sonya too, but it somehow failed to come off, and she went in a flutter out of the room. But Avdotya Romanovna seemed to await her turn, and, following her mother out, gave Sonia an attentive, courteous bow. Sonia, in confusion, gave a hurried, frightened curtsy. There was a look of poignant discomfort in her face, as though Avdotya Romanovna's courtesy and attention were oppressive and painful to her. "'Donya, good-bye,' called Waskolnikov in the passage. "'Give me your hand.' "'Why, I did give it to you. Have you forgotten?' said Donya, turning warmly and awkwardly to him. Never mind, give it to me again." And he squeezed her fingers warmly. Donya smiled, flushed, pulled her hand away, and went off quite happy. "'Come, that's capital,' he said to Sonia, going back and looking brightly at her. "'God give peace to the dead. The living have still to live. That is right, isn't it?' Sonia looked surprised at the sudden brightness of his face. He looked at her for some moments in silence. The whole history of the dead father floated before his memory in those moments. "'Heavens, Donya,' Pulcheria Alexandrovna began as soon as they were in the street, "'I really feel relieved myself at coming away, more at ease. How little did I think yesterday in the train that I could ever be glad of that! I tell you again, mother, he is still very ill. Don't you see it? Perhaps worrying about us upset him. We must be patient, and much, much can be forgiven." "'Well, you were not very patient,' Pulcheria Alexandrovna caught her up, hotly and jealously. "'Do you know, Donya, I was looking at you too. You are the very portrait of him, and not so much in face as in soul. You are both melancholy, both morose and hot-tempered, both haughty and both generous. Surely he can't be an egotist, Donya, eh? When I think of what is in store for us this evening, my heart sinks. Don't be uneasy, mother. What must be, will be. Donya, only think what a position we are in. What if Pyotr Petrovitch breaks it off?" Poor Pulcheria Alexandrovna blurted out incautiously. "'He won't be worth much if he does,' answered Donya sharply and contemptuously. "'We did well to come away. Pulcheria Alexandrovna hurriedly broke in. He was in a hurry about some business or other. If he gets out and has a breath of air—it is fearfully close in his room, 
but where is one to get a breath of air here? The very streets here feel like shut-up rooms. Good heavens! What a town! Stay, this side. They will crush you, carrying something. Why, it is a piano they have got, I declare. How they push! I am very much afraid of that young woman, too." "'What young woman, mother?' "'Why, that Sofia Semyonovna, who was there just now.' "'Why?' "'I have a presentiment, Donya. Well, you may believe it or not, but as soon as she came in, that very minute, I felt that she was the chief cause of the trouble.' "'Nothing of the sort!' cried Donya, in vexation. What nonsense with your presentiments, mother! He only made her acquaintance the evening before, and he did not know her when she came in. Well, you will see. She worries me. But you will see, you will see. I was so frightened. She was gazing at me with those eyes. I could scarcely sit still in my chair when he began introducing her, do you remember? It seems so strange. But Pietro Petrovitch writes like that about her, and he introduces her to us, to you. So he must think a great deal of her. People will write anything. We were talked about and written about, too. Have you forgotten? I am sure that she is a good girl, and that it is all nonsense. God grant it may be. And Pietro Petrovitch is a contemptible slanderer, Donya snapped out suddenly. Polcheria Alexandrovna was crushed. The conversation was not resumed. "'I will tell you what I want with you,' said Raskolnikov, drawing Razumi into the window. "'Then I will tell Katerina Ivanovna that you are coming,' Sonia said hurriedly, preparing to depart. "'One minute, Sofia Semyonovna. We have no secrets. You are not in our way. I want to have another word or two with you. Listen.' He turned suddenly to Razumihin again. You know that, what's his name, Porfiry Petrovitch? I should think so. He is a relation. Why? added the latter, with interest. Is not he managing that case? You know, about that murder? You were speaking about it yesterday. Yes. Well? Razumihin's eyes opened wide. He was inquiring for people who had pawned things, and I have some pledges there, too. Trifles, a ring my sister gave me as a keepsake when I left home, and my father's silver watch. They are only worth five or six roubles together. But I value them. So what am I to do now? I do not want to lose the things, especially the watch. I was quaking just now, for fear mother would ask to look at it, when we spoke of Donya's watch. It is the only thing a father's left us. She would be ill if it were lost. You know what women are. So tell me what to do. I know I ought to have given notice at the police station, but would it not be better to go straight to Porfiry, eh? What do you think? The matter might be settled more quickly. You see, mother may ask for it before dinner. Certainly not to the police station. Certainly to Porfiry, Razumian shouted in extraordinary excitement. Well, how glad I am! Let us go at once. It is a couple of steps. We shall be sure to find him. Very well, let us go. And he will be very, very glad to make your acquaintance. I have often talked to him of you at different times. I was speaking of you yesterday. Let us go. So you knew the old woman? So that's it. It is all turning out splendidly. Oh, yes, Sofia Ivanovna. Sofia Semyonovna, corrected Raskolnikov. Sofia Semyonovna, this is my friend Razumian, and he is a good man. If you have to go now, Sonia was beginning, not looking at Razumian at all, and still more embarrassed. Let us go, decided Raskolnikov. I will come to you today, Sofia Semyonovna. Only tell me where you live. He was not exactly ill at ease, but seemed hurried, and avoided her eyes. Sonia gave her address, and flushed as she did so. They all went out together. Don't you lock up? asked Razumihin, following him on to the stairs. Never, answered Raskolnikov. I have been meaning to buy a lock for these two years. People are happy who have no need of locks, he said, laughing to Sonia. They stood still in the gateway. Do you go to the right, Sofia Semyonovna? How did you find me, by the way? 
he added, as though he wanted to say something quite different. He wanted to look at her soft, clear eyes, but this was not easy. "'Why, you gave your address to Polenka yesterday.' "'Polenka? Oh, yes, Polenka. That is the little girl. She is your sister? Did I give her the address?' Why, had you forgotten? No, I remember. I had heard my father speak of you, only I did not know your name, and he did not know it. And now I came, and as I had learnt your name, I asked today, where does Mr. Raskolnikov live? I did not know you had only a room, too. Good-bye, I will tell Katerina Ivanovna. She was extremely glad to escape at last. She went away looking down, hurrying to get out of sight as soon as possible, to walk the twenty steps to the turning on the right and to be at last alone, and then, moving rapidly along, looking at no one, noticing nothing, to think, to remember, to meditate on every word, every detail. Never, never had she felt anything like this. Dimly and unconsciously a whole new world was opening before her. She remembered suddenly that Raskolnikov meant to come to her that day, perhaps at once. Only not today, please, not today, she kept muttering with a sinking heart, as though entreating someone like a frightened child. Mercy, to me, to that room, he will see, oh dear. She was not capable at that instant of noticing an unknown gentleman who was watching her and following at her heels. He had accompanied her from the gateway. At the moment when Razumian, Raskolnikov, and she stood still at parting on the pavement, this gentleman, who was just passing, started on hearing Sonia's words. And I asked where Mr. Raskolnikov lived. He turned on a rapid but attentive look upon all three, especially upon Raskolnikov, to whom Sonia was speaking. Then looked back and noted the house. All this was done in an instant as he passed, and trying not to betray his interest, he walked on more slowly as though waiting for something. He was waiting for Sonia. He saw that they were parting and that Sonia was going home. Home? Where? I've seen that face somewhere, he thought. I must find out. At the turning he crossed over, looked round and saw Sonia coming the same way, noticing nothing. She turned the corner. He followed her on the other side. After about fifty paces he crossed over again, overtook her and kept two or three yards behind her. He was a man about fifty, rather tall and thickly set, with broad high shoulders which made him look as though he stooped a little. He wore good and fashionable clothes, and looked like a gentleman of position. He carried a handsome cane, which he tapped on the pavement at each step. His gloves were spotless. He had a broad, rather pleasant face with high cheekbones and a fresh color, not often seen in Petersburg. His flaxen hair was still abundant, and only touched here and there with gray, and his thick square beard was even lighter than his hair. His eyes were blue, and had a cold and thoughtful look. His lips were crimson. He was a remarkably well-preserved man, and looked much younger than his years. When Sonia came out on the canal bank, they were the only two persons on the pavement. He observed her dreaminess and preoccupation. On reaching the house where she lodged, Sonia turned in at the gate. He followed her, seeming rather surprised. In the courtyard she turned to the right corner. Bah! muttered the unknown gentleman and mounted the stairs behind her. Only then Sonia noticed him. She reached the third story, turned down the passage, and rang at number nine. On the door was inscribed in chalk, Kepernomov, Taylor. Bah! the stranger repeated again, wondering at the strange coincidence, and he rang next door at number eight. The doors were two or three yards apart. You lodge at Kepernomov's, he said, looking at Sonia and laughing. He altered a waistcoat for me yesterday. I am staying close here at Madame Reslich's. How odd! Sonia looked at him attentively. We are neighbors," he went on gaily. I only came to town the day before yesterday. Good-bye for the present. Sonia made no reply. The door opened and she slipped in. She felt for some reason ashamed and uneasy. On the way to Porfiry's, Razumian was obviously excited. 
that's capital, brother," he repeated several times, and I am glad, I am glad. What are you glad about? Raskolnikov thought to himself. I didn't know that you pledged things at the old woman's, too. And was it long ago? I mean, was it long since you were there? What a simple-hearted fool he is! When was it? Raskolnikov stopped still to recollect. Two or three days before her death it must have been. But I am not going to redeem the things now," he put in with a sort of hurried and conspicuous solicitude about the things. I've not more than a silver rouble left, after last night's accursed delirium. He laid special emphasis on the delirium. Yes, yes, Razumian hastened to agree, with what was not clear. Then that's why you were stuck, partly. You know, in your delirium you were continually mentioning some rings or chains. Yes, yes, that's clear, it's all clear now." Hullo! How that idea must have got about among them! Here this man will go to the stake for me, and I find him delighted at having it cleared up why I spoke of rings in my delirium. What a hold the idea must have on all of them!" "'Shall we find him?' he asked suddenly. Oh, yes, Razumian answered quickly. He is a nice fellow, you will see, brother. Rather clumsy, that is to say, he is a man of polished manners, but I mean clumsy in a different sense. He is an intelligent fellow, very much so indeed, but he has his own range of ideas. He is incredulous, skeptical, cynical. He likes to impose on people, or rather to make fun of them. His is the old circumstantial method but he understands his work thoroughly. Last year he cleared up a case of murder in which the police had hardly a clue. He is very, very anxious to make your acquaintance." "'On what grounds is he so anxious?' "'Oh, it's not exactly—you see, since you've been ill I happen to have mentioned you several times. So when he heard about you, about your being a law student and not able to finish your studies, he said, what a pity! And so I concluded, from everything together, not only that. Yesterday, Zamatov, you know, Rodya, I talked some nonsense on the way home to you yesterday, when I was drunk. I am afraid, brother, of your exaggerating it, you see." What? That they think I am a madman? Maybe they are right, he said with a constrained smile. Yes, yes. That is, pooh, no. But all that I said, and there was something else, too. It was all nonsense, drunken nonsense. But why are you apologizing? I am so sick of it all!" Raskolnikov cried with exaggerated irritability. It was partly assumed, however. I know, I know, I understand. Believe me, I understand. One's ashamed to speak of it. If you are ashamed, then don't speak of it. Both were silent. Razumian was more than ecstatic, and Raskolnikov perceived it with repulsion. He was alarmed, too, by what Razumian had just said about Porfiry. "'She'll have to pull a long face with him, too,' he thought, with a beating heart, and he turned white. "'And do it naturally, too. But the most natural thing would be to do nothing at all. Carefully do nothing at all. No, carefully would not be natural again. Oh, well, we shall see how it turns out. We shall see directly. Is it a good thing to go or not? The butterfly flies to the light. My heart is beating, that's what's bad." "'In this grey house,' said Razumian. "'The most important thing, does Porfiry know that I was at the old hag's flat yesterday, and asked about the blood? I must find out that instantly, as soon as I go in find out from his face. Otherwise, I'll find out if it's my ruin." "'I say, brother,' he said suddenly, addressing Razumian with a sly smile, "'I have been noticing all day that you seem to be curiously excited. Isn't it so?' "'Excited? Not a bit of it,' said Razumian, stung to the quick. "'Yes, brother, I assure you, it's noticeable. Why, you sat on your chair in a way you never do sit on the edge somehow, and you seemed to be writhing all the time. You kept jumping up for nothing. One moment you were angry, and the next your face looked like a sweetmeat. 
You even blushed, especially when you were invited to dinner. You blushed awfully." "'Nothing of the sort. Nonsense. What do you mean?' "'But why are you wriggling out of it, like a schoolboy? By Jove, there he's blushing again! What a pig you are! But why are you so shamefaced about it, Romeo? Stay, I'll tell you of today. Ha, ha, ha! I'll make mother laugh and someone else laugh too. Listen, 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 this is serious. What next, you fiend? Resumian was utterly overwhelmed, turning cold with horror. What will you tell them? Come, brother! Foo! What a pig you are! You are like a summer rose. And if only you knew how it suits you! A Romeo over six foot high! And how you've washed today! You cleaned your nails, I declare, eh? That's something unheard of! Why, I do believe you've got pomatum on your hair! Bend down! Pig! Raskolnikov laughed as though he could not restrain himself. So laughing, they entered Porfiry Petrovitch's flat. This is what Raskolnikov wanted. From within they could be heard laughing as they came in, still guffawing in the passage. "'Not a word here, or I'll—' "'Brain you!' Razumin whispered furiously, seizing Raskolnikov by the shoulder. End of Part 3, Chapter 4 Part 3, Chapter 5 Raskolnikov was already entering the room. He came in looking as though he had the utmost difficulty not to burst out laughing again. Behind him Razumian strode in gawky and awkward, shamefaced and red as a peony, with an utterly crestfallen and ferocious expression. His face and whole figure really were ridiculous at that moment, and amply justified Raskolnikov's laughter. Raskolnikov, not waiting for an introduction, bowed to Porfiry Petrovitch, who stood in the middle of the room, looking inquiringly at them. He held out his hand and shook hands, still apparently making desperate efforts to subdue his mirth and utter a few words to introduce himself. But he had no sooner succeeded in assuming a serious air and muttering something, when he suddenly glanced again as though accidentally at Razumian, who could no longer control himself. His stifled laughter broke out the more irresistibly the more he tried to restrain it. The extraordinary ferocity with which Razumian received this spontaneous mirth gave the whole scene the appearance of most genuine fun and naturalness. Razumian strengthened this impression as though on purpose. "'Fool! You fiend!' he roared, waving his arm which at once struck a little round table with an empty tea-glass on it. Everything was sent flying and crashing. "'But why break chairs, gentlemen? You know it's a loss to the crown,' Porfiry Petrovitch quoted gaily. Raskolnikov was still laughing, with his hand in Porfiry Petrovitch's, but anxious not to overdo it, awaited the right moment to put a natural end to it. Razumian, completely put to confusion by upsetting the table and smashing the glass, gazed gloomily at the fragments cursed and turned sharply to the window where he stood looking out with his back to the company, with a fiercely scowling countenance, seeing nothing. Porfiry Petrovitch laughed and was ready to go on laughing, but obviously looked for explanations. Zamatov had been sitting in the corner, but he rose at the visitor's entrance and was standing in expectation with a smile on his lips though he looked with surprise and even it seemed incredulity at the whole scene and at Raskolnikov with a certain embarrassment. Zamatov's unexpected presence struck Raskolnikov unpleasantly. "'I've got to think of that,' he thought. "'Excuse me, please,' he began, affecting extreme embarrassment. "'Raskolnikov!' "'Not at all. Very pleasant to see you. And how pleasantly you've come in! Why, won't he even say good morning?' Porfiry Petrovitch nodded at Razumian. Upon my honor, I don't know why he is in such a rage with me. I only told him as we came along that he was like Romeo, and proved it. And that was all, I think." "'Pig!' ejaculated Razumian, without turning round. "'There must have been very grave grounds for it, if he is so furious at the word,' Porfiry laughed. "'Oh, you sharp lawyer! Damn you all! 
snapped Razumian, and suddenly, bursting out laughing himself, he went up to Porfiry with a more cheerful face, as though nothing had happened. "'That'll do. We are all fools. To come to business. This is my friend Rodion Romanovich Raskolnikov. In the first place, he has heard of you and wants to make your acquaintance, and secondly, he has a little matter of business with you. Bah! Zamatov, what brought you here? Have you met before? Have you known each other long?" "'What does this mean?' thought Raskolnikov uneasily. Zamatov seemed taken aback, but not very much so. "'Why, it was at your rooms we met yesterday,' he said easily. "'Then I have been spared the trouble. All last week he was begging me to introduce him to you. Porfiry and you have sniffed each other out without me. Where is your tobacco?' Porfiry Petrovich was wearing a dressing-gown, very clean linen, and trodden-down slippers. He was a man of about five-and-thirty, short, stout even to corpulence, and clean-shaven. He wore his hair cut short, and had a large round head, particularly prominent at the back. His soft, round, rather snub-nosed face was of a sickly yellowish color, but had a vigorous and rather ironical expression. It would have been good-natured, except for a look in the eyes, which shone with a watery, mawkish light under almost white, blinking eyelashes. The expression of those eyes was strangely out of keeping with his somewhat womanish figure, and gave it something far more serious than could be guessed at first sight. As soon as Porfiry Petrovich heard that his visitor had a little matter of business with him, he begged him to sit down on the sofa and sat down himself on the other end waiting for him to explain his business, with that careful and over-serious attention, which is at once oppressive and embarrassing, especially to a stranger, and especially if what you are discussing is, in your opinion, of far too little importance for such exceptional solemnity. But in brief and coherent phrases, Raskolnikov explained his business clearly and exactly, and was so well satisfied with himself that he even succeeded in taking a good look at Porfiry. Porfiry Petrovich did not once take his eyes off him. Razumian, sitting opposite at the same table, listened warmly and impatiently, looking from one to the other every moment with rather excessive interest. Fool! Raskolnikov swore to himself. You have to give information to the police, Porfiry replied, with a most businesslike air that having learnt of this incident, that is, of the murder, you beg to inform the lawyer in charge of the case that such and such things belong to you, and that you desire to redeem them, or, but they will write to you. That's just the point, that, at the present moment, Raskolnikov tried his utmost to feign embarrassment, I am not quite in funds, and even this trifling sum is beyond me. I only wanted, you see, for the present to declare that the things are mine, and that when I have money—" "'That's no matter,' answered Porfiry Petrovich, receiving his explanation of his pecuniary position coldly. "'But you can, if you prefer, write straight to me, to say that having been informed of the matter, and claiming such and such as your property, you beg—' "'On an ordinary sheet of paper?' Raskolnikov interrupted eagerly, again interested in the financial side of the question. Oh, the most ordinary!" And suddenly Porfiry Petrovich looked with obvious irony at him, screwing up his eyes and, as it were, winking at him. But perhaps it was Raskolnikov's fancy, for it all lasted but a moment. There was certainly something of the sort. Raskolnikov could have sworn he winked at him, goodness knows why. He knows, flashed through his mind like lightning. Forgive my troubling you about such trifles he went on, a little disconcerted. The things are only worth five roubles, but I prize them particularly for the sake of those from whom they came to me, and I must confess that I was alarmed when I heard. That's why you were so much struck when I mentioned to Zosimov that Porfiry was inquiring for everyone who had pledges," Razumihin put in with obvious intention. This was really unbearable. Raskolnikov could not help glancing at him with a flash of vindictive anger in his black eyes, but immediately recollected himself. "'You seem to be jeering at me, brother?' 
he said to him with a well-feigned irritability. I dare say I do seem to you absurdly anxious about such trash, but you mustn't think me selfish or grasping for that, and these two things may be anything but trash in my eyes. I told you just now that the silver watch, though it's not worth a cent, is the only thing left us of my father's. You may laugh at me, but my mother is here." He turned suddenly to Porphyry. And if she knew— He turned again hurriedly to Resumian, carefully making his voice tremble. That the watch was lost, she would be in despair. You know what women are. Not a bit of it. I didn't mean that at all. Quite the contrary," shouted Resumian, distressed. Was it right? Was it natural? Did I overdo it? Raskolnikov asked himself in a tremor. Why did I say that about women? Oh, your mother is with you? Porfiry Petrovich inquired. Yes. When did she come? Last night. Porfiry paused, as though reflecting. Your things would not in any case be lost," he went on calmly and coldly. I have been expecting you here for some time. And as though that was a matter of no importance, he carefully offered the ashtray to Razumian, who was ruthlessly scattering cigarette ash over the carpet. Raskolnikov shuddered, but Porfiry did not seem to be looking at him, and was still concerned with Razumian's cigarette. What? Expecting him? Why, did you know that he had pledges there?" cried Razumian. Porfiry Petrovich addressed himself to Raskolnikov. Your things, the ring and the watch, were wrapped up together, and on the paper your name was legibly written in pencil, together with the date on which you left them with her. How observant you are! Raskolnikov smiled awkwardly, doing his very utmost to look him straight in the face. But he failed, and suddenly added, I say that because I suppose there were a great many pledges, that it must be difficult to remember them all, but you remember them all so clearly, and, and—" Stupid! Feeble! he thought. Why did I add that? But we know all who had pledges, and you are the only one who hasn't come forward," Porfiry answered with hardly perceptible irony. I haven't been quite well. I heard that, too. I heard, indeed, that you were in great distress about something. You look pale still." "'I am not pale at all. No, I am quite well,' Raskolnikov snapped out rudely and angrily, completely changing his tone. His anger was mounting. He could not repress it. "'And in my anger I shall betray myself,' flashed through his mind again. "'Why are they torturing me?' "'Not quite well. Razumian caught him up. What next? He was unconscious and delirious all yesterday. Would you believe, Porfiry, as soon as our backs were turned, he dressed, though he could hardly stand, and gave us the slip and went off on a spree somewhere till midnight, delirious all the time. Would you believe it? Extraordinary!" Really delirious? You don't say so. Porfiry shook his head in a womanish way. Nonsense! Don't you believe it? But you don't believe it anyway." Raskolnikov let slip his anger. But Porfiry Petrovich did not seem to catch those strange words. "'But how could you have gone out if you hadn't been delirious?' Razumian got hot suddenly. "'What did you go out for? What was the object of it? And why on the sly? Were you in your senses when you did it? Now that all the danger is over, I can speak plainly. I was awfully sick of them yesterday." Raskolnikov addressed Porfiry suddenly with a smile of insolent defiance. I ran away from them to take lodgings where they wouldn't find me, and took a lot of money with me. Mr. Zamatov there saw it. I say, Mr. Zamatov, was I sensible or delirious yesterday? Settle our dispute." He could have strangled Zamatov at that moment, so hateful were his expression and his silence to him. In my opinion you talked sensibly and even artfully, but you were extremely irritable," Zamatov pronounced dryly. "'And Nikodim Fomitch was telling me today," put in Porfiry Petrovich, "'that he met you very late last night in the lodging of a man who had been run over.' 
"'And there,' said Resumian, "'weren't you mad then? You gave your last penny to the widow for the funeral. If you wanted to help, give fifteen or twenty even, but keep three roubles for yourself at least, but he flung away all the twenty-five at once. Maybe I found a treasure somewhere and you know nothing of it. So that's why I was liberal yesterday. Mr. Zamatov knows I found a treasure. Excuse us, please, for disturbing you for half an hour with such trivialities, he said, turning to Porfiry Petrovitch with trembling lips. We are boring you, aren't we? Oh, no, quite the contrary, quite the contrary. If only you knew how you interest me. It's interesting to look on and listen. And I am really glad you have come forward at last. But you might give us some tea. My throat's dry, cried Resumian. Capital idea. Perhaps we will all keep you company. Would you like something more essential before tea? Get along with you. Porfiry Petrovitch went out to order tea. Raskolnikov's thoughts were in a whirl. He was in terrible exasperation. The worst of it is, they don't disguise it. They don't care to stand on ceremony. And how, if you didn't know me at all, did you come to talk to Nikodem Fomich about me? So they don't care to hide that they are tracking me like a pack of dogs. They simply spit in my face." He was shaking with rage. "'Come, strike me openly. Don't play with me like a cat with a mouse. It's hardly civil, Porfiry Petrovitch, but perhaps I won't allow it. I shall get up and throw the whole truth in your ugly faces, and you'll see how I despise you.' He could hardly breathe. And what if it's only my fancy? What if I am mistaken, and through inexperience I get angry, and don't keep up my nasty part? Perhaps it's all unintentional. All their phrases are the usual ones, but there is something about them. It all might be said, but there is something. Why did he say bluntly, with her? Why did Zamatov add that I spoke artfully? Why do they speak in that tone? Yes, the tone. Resumian is sitting here. Why does he see nothing? That innocent blockhead never does see anything. Feverish again. Did Porfiry wink at me just now? Of course, it's nonsense. What could he wink for? Are they trying to upset my nerves, or are they teasing me? Either it's ill fancy, or they know. Even Zamatov is rude. Is Zamatov rude? Zamatov has changed his mind. I foresaw he would change his mind. He is at home here, while it's my first visit. Porfiry does not consider him a visitor, sits with his back to him. They're as thick as thieves, no doubt, over me. Not a doubt they were talking about me before we came. Do they know about the flat? If only they make haste. When I said that I ran away to take a flat, he let it pass. I put that in cleverly about a flat. It may be of use afterwards. Delirious indeed! Ha, ha, ha! He knows all about last night. He didn't know of my mother's arrival. The hag had written the date on in pencil. You are wrong. You won't catch me. There are no facts. It's all supposition. You produce facts. The flat even isn't a fact, but delirium. I know what to say to them. Do they know about the flat? I won't go without finding out. What did I come for? But my being angry now, maybe, is a fact. Fool, how irritable I am! Perhaps that's right, to play the invalid. He is feeling me. He will try to catch me. Why did I come? All this flashed like lightning through his mind. Porfiry Petrovitch returned quickly. He became suddenly more jovial. "'Your party yesterday, brother, has left my head rather... and I am out of sorts altogether,' he began in a quite different tone, laughing to Resumian. "'Was it interesting? I left you yesterday at the most interesting point. Who got the best of it?' "'Oh, no one, of course. They got on to everlasting questions, floated off into space. Only fancy, Rodya, what we got on to yesterday. 
whether there is such a thing as crime. I told you that we talked our heads off." "'What is there strange? It's an everyday social question,' Raskolnikov answered casually. "'The question wasn't put quite like that,' observed Porfiry. "'Not quite, that's true,' Razumin agreed at once, getting warm and hurried as usual. "'Listen, Rodian, and tell us your opinion. I want to hear it. I was fighting tooth and nail with them and wanted you to help me. I told them you were coming. It began with the Socialist doctrine. You know their doctrine. Crime is a protest against the abnormality of the social organization and nothing more, and nothing more, no other causes admitted." "'You are wrong there!' cried Porfiry Petrovitch. He was noticeably animated and kept laughing as he looked at Razumian, which made him more excited than ever. "'Nothing is admitted.' Razumian interrupted with heat. "'I am not wrong. I'll show you their pamphlets. Everything with them is the influence of the environment and nothing else. Their favorite phrase. From which it follows that, if society is normally organized, all crime will cease at once, since there will be nothing to protest against and all men will become righteous in one instant. Human nature is not taken into account. It is excluded. It is not supposed to exist.' They don't recognize that humanity, developing by a historical living process, will become at last a normal society, but they believe that a social system that has come out of some mathematical brain is going to organize all humanity at once and make it just and sinless in an instant, quicker than any living process. That's why they instinctively dislike history. Nothing but ugliness and stupidity in it. And they explain it all as stupidity. That's why they so dislike the living process of life. They don't want a living soul. The living soul demands life. The soul won't obey the rules of mechanics. The soul is an object of suspicion. The soul is retrograde. But what they want, though it smells of death and can be made of India rubber, at least is not alive, has no will, is servile, and won't revolt and it comes in the end to their reducing everything to the building of walls and the planning of rooms and passages and a phalanstery. The phalanstery is ready, indeed, but your human nature is not ready for the phalanstery. It wants life, it hasn't completed its vital process. It's too soon for the graveyard. You can't skip over nature by logic. Logic presupposes three possibilities, but there are millions. Cut away a million and reduce it all to the question of comfort. That's the easiest solution of the problem. It's seductively clear, and you mustn't think about it. That's the great thing. You mustn't think. The whole secret of life in two pages of print. Now he is off, beating the drum. Catch hold of him, do! laughed Porfiry. Can you imagine, he turned to Raskolnikov, six people holding forth like that last night, in one room, with punch as a preliminary? No, brother, you are wrong. Environment accounts for a great deal in crime. I can assure you of that." "'Oh, I know it does. But just tell me. A man of forty violates a child of ten. Was it environment drove him to it?' "'Well, strictly speaking, it did,' Porfiry observed with noteworthy gravity. "'A crime of that nature may be very well ascribed to the influence of environment.' Razumian was almost in a frenzy. "'Oh, if you like,' he roared. I'll prove to you that your white eyelashes may very well be ascribed to the Church of Ivan the Great's being two hundred and fifty feet high, and I will prove it clearly, exactly, progressively, and even with a liberal tendency. I undertake to. Will you bet on it?" Done. Let's hear, please. How will he prove it? He is always humbugging, confound him," cried Razumian, jumping up and gesticulating. What's the use of talking to you? He does all that on purpose. You don't know him, Rodian. He took their side yesterday, simply to make fools of them. And the things he said yesterday! And they were delighted. He can keep it up for a fortnight together. Last year he persuaded us that he was going into a monastery. He stuck to it for two months. Not long ago he took it into his head to declare he was going to get married, that he had everything ready for the wedding. He ordered new clothes indeed. We all began to congratulate him. 
There was no bride, nothing, all pure fantasy. Ah, you are wrong. I got the clothes before. It was the new clothes, in fact, that made me think of taking you in." "'Are you such a good dissembler?' Raskolnikov asked carelessly. "'You wouldn't have supposed it, eh? Wait a bit, I shall take you in, too. Ha, ha, ha! No, I'll tell you the truth. All these questions about crime, environment, children, recall to my mind an article of yours which interested me at the time. On crime, or something of the sort, I forget the title, I read it with pleasure two months ago in the periodical review." "'My article? In the periodical review?' Raskolnikov asked in astonishment. "'I certainly did write an article upon a book six months ago when I left the university, but I sent it to the weekly review. But it came out in the periodical. And the weekly review ceased to exist, so that's why it wasn't printed at the time. That's true, but when it ceased to exist, the weekly review was amalgamated with the periodical, and so your article appeared two months ago in the latter. Didn't you know? Raskolnikov had not known. Why, you might get some money out of them for the article. What a strange person you are! You lead such a solitary life that you know nothing of matters that concern you directly. It's a fact, I assure you." "'Bravo, Rodya! I knew nothing about it either,' cried Razumihin. "'I'll run today to the reading-room and ask for the number. Two months ago? What was the date? It doesn't matter, though. I will find it. Think of not telling us.' "'How did you find out that the article was mine? It's only signed with an initial. I only learnt it by chance, the other day. Through the editor. I know him. I was very much interested. I analyzed, if I remember, the psychology of a criminal before and after the crime. Yes, and you maintain that the perpetration of a crime is always accompanied by illness. Very, very original. But it was not that part of your article that interested me so much but an idea at the end of the article which I regret to say you merely suggested, without working it out clearly. There is, if you recollect, a suggestion that there are certain persons who can, that is, not precisely are able to, but have a perfect right to commit breaches of morality and crimes, and that the law is not for them." Raskolnikov smiled at the exaggerated and intentional distortion of his idea. What? What do you mean? a right to crime, but not because of the influence of environment," Razumian inquired with some alarm even. "'No, not exactly because of it,' answered Porfiry. In his article, all men are divided into ordinary and extraordinary. Ordinary men have to live in submission, have no right to transgress the law, because, don't you see, they are ordinary. But extraordinary men have a right to commit any crime and to transgress the law in any way, just because they are extraordinary. That was your idea, if I am not mistaken." "'What do you mean? That can't be right!' Razumian muttered in bewilderment. Raskolnikov smiled again. He saw the point at once and knew where they wanted to drive him. He decided to take up the challenge. "'That wasn't quite my contention he began simply and modestly. Yet I admit that you have stated it almost correctly, perhaps, if you like, perfectly so." It almost gave him pleasure to admit this. The only difference is that I don't contend that extraordinary people are always bound to commit breaches of morals, as you call it. In fact, I doubt whether such an argument could be published. I simply hinted that an extraordinary man has the right that is not an official right, but an inner right to decide in his own conscience to overstep certain obstacles, and only in case it is essential for the practical fulfillment of his idea, sometimes perhaps of benefit to the whole of humanity. You say that my article isn't definite. I am ready to make it as clear as I can. Perhaps I am right in thinking you want me to. Very well. I maintain that if the discoveries of Kepler and Newton could not have been made known except by sacrificing the lives of one, a dozen, a hundred or more men, Newton would have had the right, would indeed have been in duty bound, 
to eliminate the dozen or the hundred men for the sake of making his discoveries known to the whole of humanity. But it does not follow from that that Newton had a right to murder people right and left, and to steal every day in the market. Then, I remember, I maintained in my article that all, well, legislators and leaders of men, such as Lycurgus, Solon, Mahomet, Napoleon, and so on, were all without exception criminals, from the very fact that, making a new law, they transgressed the ancient one, handed down from their ancestors and held sacred by the people, and they did not stop short at bloodshed either, if that bloodshed, often of innocent persons fighting bravely in defense of ancient law, were of use to their cause. It's remarkable, in fact, that the majority indeed of these benefactors and leaders of humanity were guilty of terrible carnage. In short, I maintain that all great men, or even men a little out of the common, that is to say, capable of giving some new word, must from their very nature be criminals, more or less, of course. Otherwise, it's hard for them to get out of the common rut, and to remain in the common rut is what they can't submit to, from their very nature again, and to my mind they ought not, indeed, to submit to it. You see that there is nothing particularly new in all that. The same thing has been printed and read a thousand times before. As for my division of people into ordinary and extraordinary, I acknowledge that it's somewhat arbitrary, but I don't insist upon exact numbers. I only believe in my leading idea that men are in general divided by a law of nature into two categories, inferior, ordinary, that is, so to say, material that serves only to reproduce its kind, and men who have the gift or the talent to utter a new word. There are, of course, innumerable subdivisions, but the distinguishing features of both categories are fairly well marked. The first category, generally speaking, are men conservative in temperament and law-abiding. They live under control and love to be controlled. To my thinking, it is their duty to be controlled, because that's their vocation, and there is nothing humiliating in it for them. The second category all transgress the law. They are destroyers, or disposed to destruction according to their capacities. The crimes of these men are of course relative and varied. For the most part, they seek in very varied ways the destruction of the present for the sake of the better. But if such a one is forced, for the sake of his idea, to step over a corpse or wade through blood, he can, I maintain, find within himself, in his conscience, a sanction for wading through blood. That depends on the idea and its dimensions, note that. It's only in that sense I speak of their right to crime in my article. You remember it began with the legal question. There is no need for such anxiety, however. The masses will scarcely ever admit this right. They punish them or hang them, more or less, and in doing so fulfill quite justly their conservative vocation. But the same masses set these criminals on a pedestal in the next generation and worship them, more or less. The first category is always the man of the present, the second the man of the future. The first preserve the world and people in it, the second move the world and lead it to its goal. Each class has an equal right to exist. In fact, all have equal rights with me and vive la guerre éternelle, till the New Jerusalem, of course." "'Then you believe in the New Jerusalem, do you?' "'I do,' Raskolnikov answered firmly. As he said these words, and during the whole preceding tirade, he kept his eyes on one spot on the carpet. "'And—and and do you believe in God? Excuse my curiosity.' "'I do,' repeated Raskolnikov, raising his eyes to Porfiry. And do you believe in Lazarus rising from the dead? I, I do. Why do you ask all this? You believe it literally? Literally. You don't say so. I asked from curiosity. Excuse me. But let us go back to the question. They are not always executed. Some, on the contrary. Triumph in their lifetime? Oh, yes, some attain their ends in this life, and then— they begin executing other people. If it's necessary. Indeed, for the most part, they do. Your remark is very witty. Thank you. But tell me this. How do you distinguish these extraordinary people from the ordinary ones? Are there signs at their birth? 
I feel there ought to be more exactitude, more external definition. Excuse the natural anxiety of a practical law-abiding citizen, but couldn't they adopt a special uniform, for instance? Couldn't they wear something, be branded in some way? For you know if confusion arises, and a member of one category imagines that he belongs to the other, begins to eliminate obstacles, as you so happily express it, then— Oh, that very often happens. That remark is wittier than the other. Thank you. No reason to. But take note that the mistake can only arise in the first category, that is, among the ordinary people, as I perhaps unfortunately called them. In spite of their predisposition to obedience, very many of them, through a playfulness of nature, sometimes vouchsafed even to the cow, like to imagine themselves advanced people, destroyers, and to push themselves into the new movement, and this quite sincerely. Meanwhile, the really new people are very often unobserved by them, or even despised as reactionaries of groveling tendencies. But I don't think there is any considerable danger here, and you really need not be uneasy, for they never go very far. Of course, they might have a thrashing sometimes for letting their fancy run away with them and to teach them their place, but no more. In fact, even this isn't necessary, as they castigate themselves, for they are very conscientious. Some perform this service for one another, and others chastise themselves with their own hands. They will impose various public acts of penitence upon themselves with a beautiful and edifying effect. In fact, you've nothing to be uneasy about. It's a law of nature." Well, you have certainly set my mind more at rest on that score. But there's another thing worries me. Tell me, please, are there many people who have the right to kill others, these extraordinary people? I am ready to bow down to them, of course, but you must admit it's alarming if there are a great many of them, eh?" Oh, you needn't worry about that, either," Raskolnikov went on in the same tone. People with new ideas, people with the faintest capacity for saying something new, are extremely few in number, extraordinarily so, in fact. One thing only is clear, that the appearance of all these grades and subdivisions of men must follow with unfailing regularity some law of nature. That law, of course, is unknown at present, but I am convinced that it exists, and one day may become known. The vast mass of mankind is mere material, and only exists in order by some great effort, by some mysterious process, by means of some crossing of races and stocks, to bring into the world at last perhaps one man out of a thousand with a spark of independence. One in ten thousand, perhaps, I speak roughly, approximately, is born with some independence, and with still greater independence one in a hundred thousand. The man of genius is one of millions, and the great geniuses, the crown of humanity, appear on earth perhaps one in many thousand millions. In fact, I have not peeped into the retort in which all this takes place, but there certainly is and must be a definite law. It cannot be a matter of chance." "'Why, are you both joking?' Razumian cried at last. "'There you sit, making fun of one another. Are you serious, Rodya?' Raskolnikov raised his pale and almost mournful face, and made no reply. And the unconcealed, persistent, nervous, and discourteous sarcasm of Porfiry seemed strange to resume in, beside that quiet and mournful face. "'Well, brother, if you are really serious. You are right, of course, in saying that it's not new, that it's like what we've read and heard a thousand times already. But what is really original in all this, and is exclusively your own, to my horror, is that you sanction bloodshed in the name of conscience and, excuse my saying so, with such fanaticism. That, I take it, is the point of your article. But that sanction of bloodshed by conscience is, to my mind, more terrible than the official, legal sanction of bloodshed." "'You are quite right. It is more terrible,' Porfiry agreed. "'Yes, you must have exaggerated. There is some mistake. I shall read it. You can't think that. I shall read it.' All that is not in the article. There's only a hint of it," said Raskolnikov. Yes, yes, Porfiry couldn't sit still. Your attitude to crime is pretty clear to me now, but— Excuse me for my impertinence. I am really ashamed to be worrying you like this. 
You see, you've removed my anxiety as to the two grades getting mixed, but there are various practical possibilities that make me uneasy. What if some man or youth imagines that he is a Lycurgus or Mahomet, a future one, of course, and suppose he begins to remove all obstacles, he has some great enterprise before him and needs money for it, and tries to get it, do you see?" Zamatov gave a sudden guffaw in his corner. Raskolnikov did not even raise his eyes to him. "'I must admit,' he went on calmly, "'that such cases certainly must arise. The vain and foolish are particularly apt to fall into that snare, young people especially. Yes, you see. Well, then? What, then? Raskolnikov smiled in reply. That's not my fault. So it is, and so it always will be. He said just now, he nodded at Razumian, that I sanction bloodshed. Society is too well protected by prisons, banishment, criminal investigators, penal servitude. There's no need to be uneasy. You have but to catch the thief. And what if we do catch him? Then he gets what he deserves. You are certainly logical, but what of his conscience? Why do you care about that? Simply from humanity. If he has a conscience, he will suffer for his mistake. That will be his punishment, as well as the prison." But the real geniuses, asked Razumian, frowning. Those who have the right to murder, oughtn't they to suffer at all, even for the blood they've shed? Why the word ought? It's not a matter of permission or prohibition. He will suffer if he is sorry for his victim. Pain and suffering are always inevitable for a large intelligence and a deep heart. The really great men must, I think, have great sadness on earth," he added dreamily, not in the tone of the conversation. He raised his eyes, looked earnestly at them all, smiled and took his cap. He was too quiet by comparison with his manner at his entrance, and he felt this. Everyone got up. "'Well, you may abuse me, be angry with me if you like,' Porfiry Petrovich began again. "'But I can't resist. Allow me one little question. I know I am troubling you. There is just one little notion I want to express simply that I may not forget it." "'Very good. Tell me your little notion.' Raskolnikov stood waiting, pale and grave before him. "'Well, you see, I really don't know how to express it properly. It's a playful, psychological idea. When you were writing your article, surely you couldn't have helped, heh <laughs> fancying yourself just a little, an extraordinary man uttering a new word in your sense. That's so, isn't it?" "'Quite possibly,' Raskolnikov answered contemptuously. Razumian made a movement. "'And, if so, could you bring yourself, in case of worldly difficulties and hardship, or for some service to humanity, to overstep obstacles? For instance, to rob and murder?' And again he winked with his left eye, and laughed noiselessly, just as before. "'If I did, I certainly should not tell you,' Raskolnikov answered with defiant and haughty contempt. "'No, I was only interested on account of your article, from a literary point of view.' "'Foo! How obvious and insolent that is!' Raskolnikov thought with repulsion. "'Allow me to observe he answered dryly, that I don't consider myself a Mahomet or a Napoleon, nor any personage of that kind, and not being one of them, I cannot tell you how I should act. Oh, come! Don't we all think ourselves Napoleons now in Russia? Porfiry Petrovich said with alarming familiarity. Something peculiar betrayed itself in the very intonation of his voice. Perhaps it was one of these future Napoleons who did for Alyona Ivanovna last week," Zamatov blurted out from the corner. Raskolnikov did not speak, but looked firmly and intently at Porfiry. Razumian was scowling gloomily. He seemed before this to be noticing something. He looked angrily around. There was a minute of gloomy silence. Raskolnikov turned to go. "'Are you going already?' Porfiry said amiably, holding out his hand with excessive politeness. 
very, very glad of your acquaintance. As for your request, have no uneasiness. Write just as I told you, or, better still, come to me there yourself in a day or two. Tomorrow, indeed. I shall be there at eleven o'clock for certain. We'll arrange it all. We'll have a talk. As one of the last to be there, you might perhaps be able to tell us something," he added with a most good-natured expression. "'You want to cross-examine me officially in due form?' Raskolnikov asked sharply. "'Oh, why? That's not necessary for the present. You misunderstand me. I lose no opportunity, you see, and I've talked with all who had pledges. I obtained evidence from some of them, and you are the last. Yes, by the way," he cried, seemingly suddenly delighted. I just remembered what was I thinking of. He turned to Razumian. You were talking my ears off about that Nikolai. Of course, I know, I know very well, he turned to Raskolnikov, that the fellow is innocent, but what is one to do? We had to trouble Dmitri, too. This is the point, this is all. When you went up the stairs it was past seven, wasn't it?" Yes, answered Raskolnikov, with an unpleasant sensation at the very moment he spoke that he need not have said it. Then when you went upstairs between seven and eight, didn't you see in a flat that stood open on a second story, do you remember, two workmen or at least one of them? They were painting there, didn't you notice them? It's very, very important for them. Painters? No, I didn't see them," Raskolnikov answered slowly, as though ransacking his memory, while at the same instant he was racking every nerve, almost swooning with anxiety to conjecture as quickly as possible where the trap lay and not to overlook anything. No, I didn't see them, and I don't think I noticed a flat like that open. But on the fourth story— He had mastered the trap now and was triumphant. I remember now that someone was moving out of the flat opposite Alyona Ivanovna's. I remember. I remember it clearly. Some porters were carrying out a sofa and they squeezed me against the wall. But painters? No, I don't remember that there were any painters, and I don't think there was a flat open anywhere. No, there wasn't. What do you mean? Razumian shouted suddenly, as though he had reflected and realized. Why, it was on the day of the murder the painters were at work, and he was there three days before. What are you asking?" Foo! I have muddled it!" Porfiry slapped himself on the forehead. Deuce take it! This business is turning my brain!" he addressed Raskolnikov somewhat apologetically. It would be such a great thing for us to find out whether anyone had seen them between seven and eight at the flat so I fancy you could perhaps have told us something. I quite muddled it." "'Then you should be more careful,' Razumian observed grimly. The last words were uttered in the passage. Porfiry Petrovich saw them to the door with excessive politeness. They went out into the street gloomy and sullen, and for some steps they did not say a word. Raskolnikov drew a deep breath. End of Part 3, Chapter 5 Part 3, Chapter 6 "'I don't believe it! I can't believe it!' repeated Razumian, trying in perplexity to refute Raskolnikov's arguments. They were by now approaching Bakaliev's lodgings, where Pulcheria Alexandrovna and Donia had been expecting them a long while. Razumian kept stopping on the way in the heat of discussion, confused and excited by the very fact that they were for the first time speaking openly about it. "'Don't believe it, then,' answered Raskolnikov with a cold, careless smile. "'You were noticing nothing as usual, but I was weighing every word. You are suspicious. That is why you weighed their words. Hmm. Certainly, I agree. Porfiry's tone was rather strange, and still more that wretch Zamatov. You are right, there was something about him. But why? Why? He has changed his mind since last night. Quite the contrary. If they had that brainless idea, they would do their utmost to hide it, and conceal their cards, so as to catch you afterwards. But it was all impudent and careless. If they had had facts, 
I mean real facts, or at least grounds for suspicion, then they would certainly have tried to hide their game, in the hope of getting more. They would have made a search long ago, besides. But they have no facts, not one. It is all mirage, all ambiguous, simply a floating idea. So they try to throw me out by impudence. And perhaps he was irritated at having no facts, and blurted it out in his vexation. Or perhaps he has some plan. He seems an intelligent man. Perhaps he wanted to frighten me by pretending to know. They have a psychology of their own, brother. But it is loathsome explaining it all. Stop. And it's insulting, insulting. I understand you. But since we have spoken openly now, and it is an excellent thing that we have at last, I am glad. I will own now, frankly, that I noticed it in them long ago, this idea. Of course, the merest hint only, an insinuation. But why an insinuation, even? How dare they? What foundation have they? If only you knew how furious I have been! Think only! Simply because a poor student, unhinged by poverty and hypochondria, on the eve of a serious delirious illness, note that, suspicious, vain, proud, who has not seen a soul to speak to for six months, in rags and in boots without soles, has to face some wretched policeman and put up with their insolence, and the unexpected debt thrust under his nose, the I.O.U. presented by Chebarov, the new paint, thirty degrees reamure, and a stifling atmosphere, a crowd of people that talk about the murder of a person where he had been just before, and all that on an empty stomach. He might well have a fainting fit. And that, that is what they found it all on. Damn them! I understand how annoying it is, but in your place, Rodya, I would laugh at them, or, better still, spit in their ugly faces, and spit a dozen times in all directions. I'd hit out in all directions, neatly too, and so I'd put an end to it. Damn them! Don't be downhearted. It's a shame." He really has put it well, though, Raskolnikov thought. Damn them? But the cross-examination again, tomorrow," he said with bitterness. Must I really enter into explanations with them? I feel vexed as it is, that I condescended to speak to Zamatov yesterday in the restaurant. Damn it! I will go myself to Porfiry. I will squeeze it out of him, as one of the family. He must let me know the ins and outs of it all. And as for Zamatov, At last he sees through him thought Raskolnikov. "'Stay!' cried Razumian, seizing him by the shoulder again. "'Stay! You are wrong! I have thought it out! You are wrong! How was that a trap? You say that the question about the workman was a trap. But if you had done that, could you have said you had seen them painting the flat, and the workman? On the contrary, you would have seen nothing, even if you had seen it. Who would own it against himself?' If I had done that thing, I should certainly have said that I had seen the workman and the flat," Raskolnikov answered, with reluctance and obvious disgust. But why speak against yourself? Because only peasants or the most inexperienced novices deny everything flatly at examinations. If a man is ever so little developed and experienced, he will certainly try to admit all the external facts that can't be avoided, but will seek other explanations of them will introduce some special, unexpected turn, that will give them another significance and put them in another light. Porfiry might well reckon that I should be sure to answer so, and say I had seen them to give an air of truth, and then make some explanation. But he would have told you at once that the workman could not have been there two days before, and that therefore you must have been there on the day of the murder at eight o'clock, and so he would have caught you over a detail. Yes, that is what he was reckoning on, that I should not have time to reflect, and should be in a hurry to make the most likely answer, and so would forget that the workman could not have been there two days before. But how could you forget it? Nothing easier. It is in just such stupid things clever people are most easily caught. The more cunning a man is, the less he suspects he will be caught in a simple thing. The more cunning a man is, the simpler the trap he must be caught in. Porfiry is not such a fool as you think. 
He is a knave, then, if that is so." Raskolnikov could not help laughing. But at the very moment he was struck by the strangeness of his own frankness, and the eagerness with which he had made this explanation, though he had kept up all the preceding conversation with gloomy repulsion, obviously with a motive from necessity. "'I am getting a relish for certain aspects,' he thought to himself. But almost at the same instant he became suddenly uneasy, as though an unexpected and alarming idea had occurred to him. His uneasiness kept on increasing. They had just reached the entrance to Bakaliev's. "'Go in alone,' said Raskolnikov suddenly. "'I will be back directly.' "'Where are you going? Why, we are just here. I can't help it. I will come in half an hour. Tell them.' "'Say what you like. I will come with you.' "'You too want to torture me!' he screamed with such bitter irritation, such despair in his eyes that Razumian's hands dropped. He stood for some time on the steps, looking gloomily at Raskolnikov striding rapidly away in the direction of his lodging. At last, gritting his teeth and clenching his fist, he swore he would squeeze Porfiry like a lemon that very day, and went up the stairs to reassure Polcheria Alexandrovna, who was by now alarmed at their long absence. When Raskolnikov got home, his hair was soaked with sweat, and he was breathing heavily. He went rapidly up the stairs, walked into his unlocked room, and at once fastened the latch. Then, in senseless terror, he rushed to the corner, to that hole under the paper where he had put the things. He put his hand in, and for some minutes felt carefully in the hole, in every crack and fold of the paper. Finding nothing, he got up and drew a deep breath. As he was reaching the steps of Bakaliev's, he suddenly fancied that something, a chain, a stud, or even a bit of paper in which they had been wrapped with the old woman's handwriting on it, might somehow have slipped out and been lost in some crack, and then might suddenly turn up as unexpected, conclusive evidence against him. He stood as though lost in thought, and a strange, humiliated, half-senseless smile strayed on his lips. He took his cap at last and went quietly out of the room. His ideas were all tangled. He went dreamily through the gateway. "'Here he is himself!' shouted a loud voice. He raised his head. The porter was standing at the door of his little room and was pointing him out to a short man who looked like an artisan, wearing a long coat and a waistcoat, and looking at a distance remarkably like a woman. He stooped and his head in a greasy cap hung forward. From his wrinkled, flabby face he looked over fifty. His little eyes were lost in fat, and they looked out grimly, sternly, and disconnectedly. "'What is it?' Raskolnikov asked, going up to the porter. The man stole a look at him from under his brows, and he looked at him attentively, deliberately. Then he turned slowly and went out of the gate into the street without saying a word. "'What is it?' cried Raskolnikov. "'Why, he there was asking whether a student lived here, mentioned your name and whom you lodged with. I saw you coming and pointed you out and he went away. It's funny.' The porter too seemed rather puzzled, but not much so, and after wondering for a moment he turned and went back to his room. Raskolnikov ran after the stranger, and at once caught sight of him walking along the other side of the street with the same even deliberate step with his eyes fixed on the ground, as though in meditation. He soon overtook him, but for some time walked behind him. At last, moving on to a level with him, he looked at his face. The man noticed him at once, looked at him quickly, but dropped his eyes again, and so they walked for a minute side by side without uttering a word. "'You were inquiring for me, of the porter?' Raskolnikov said at last, but in a curiously quiet voice. The man made no answer, he didn't even look at him. Again they were both silent. "'Why do you? Come and ask for me, and say nothing. What's the meaning of it?' Raskolnikov's voice broke, and he seemed unable to articulate the words clearly. The man raised his eyes this time and turned a gloomy, sinister look at Raskolnikov. "'Murderer!' he said suddenly, in a quiet but clear and distinct voice. Raskolnikov went on walking beside him. His legs felt suddenly weak, a cold shiver ran down his spine, 
and his heart seemed to stand still for a moment, then suddenly began throbbing as though it were set free. So they walked for about a hundred paces, side by side, in silence. The man did not look at him. "'What do you mean? What is—who is a murderer?' muttered Raskolnikov hardly audibly. "'You are a murderer.' The man answered still more articulately and emphatically, with a smile of triumphant hatred, and again he looked straight into Raskolnikov's pale face and stricken eyes. They had just reached the crossroads. The man turned to the left without looking behind him. Raskolnikov remained standing, gazing after him. He saw him turn round fifty paces away and look back at him, still standing there. Raskolnikov could not see clearly but he fancied that he was again smiling the same smile of cold hatred and triumph. With slow, faltering steps, with shaking knees, Raskolnikov made his way back to his little garret, feeling chilled all over. He took off his cap and put it on the table, and for ten minutes he stood without moving. Then he sank exhausted on the sofa and with a weak moan of pain he stretched himself on it. So he lay for half an hour. He thought of nothing. Some thoughts or fragments of thoughts, some images without order or coherence, floated before his mind, faces of people he had seen in his childhood, or met somewhere once, whom he would never have recalled, the belfry of the church at V, the billiard-table in a restaurant, and some officers playing billiards, the smell of cigars in some underground tobacco-shop, a tavern-room, a back staircase quite dark all sloppy with dirty water and strewn with eggshells, and the Sunday bells floating in from somewhere. The images followed one another, whirling like a hurricane. Some of them he liked and tried to clutch at, but they faded and all the while there was an oppression within him, but it was not overwhelming, sometimes it was even pleasant. The slight shivering still persisted, but that too was an almost pleasant sensation. He heard the hurried footsteps of Razumian. He closed his eyes and pretended to be asleep. Razumian opened the door and stood for some time in the doorway, as though hesitating. Then he stepped softly into the room and went cautiously to the sofa. Raskolnikov heard Nastasia's whisper, "'Don't disturb him. Let him sleep. He can have his dinner later.' "'Quite so,' answered Razumian. Both withdrew carefully and closed the door. Another half-hour passed. Raskolnikov opened his eyes turned on his back again, clasping his hands behind his head. Who is he? Who is that man who sprang out of the earth? Where was he? What did he see? He has seen it all, that's clear. But where was he then? And from where did he see? Why has he only now sprung out of the earth? And how could he see? Is it possible?" Hmm, continued Raskolnikov turning cold and shivering. And the jewel-case Nikolai found behind the door! Was that possible? A clue? You miss an infinitesimal line and you can build it into a pyramid of evidence! A fly flew by and saw it! Is it possible? He felt with sudden loathing how weak, how physically weak he had become. I ought to have known it, he thought with a bitter smile. And how dared I, knowing myself, knowing how I should be, take up an axe and shed blood. I ought to have known beforehand. Ah, but I did know," he whispered in despair. At times he came to a standstill at some thought. No, those men are not made so. The real master, to whom all is permitted, storms Toulon, makes a massacre in Paris, forgets an army in Egypt wastes half a million men in the Moscow expedition and gets off with a jest at Vilna. And altars are set up to him after his death, and so all is permitted. No, such people, it seems, are not of flesh, but of bronze." One sudden irrelevant idea almost made him laugh. Napoleon, the pyramids, Waterloo, and a wretched skinny old woman, a pawnbroker with a red trunk under her bed. It's a nice hash for Porfiry Petrovitch to digest. How can they digest it? It's too inartistic. A Napoleon creep under an old woman's bed. Ugh! How loathsome! At moments he felt he was raving. 
he sank into a state of feverish excitement. The old woman is of no consequence, he thought hotly and incoherently. The old woman was a mistake, perhaps, but she is not what matters. The old woman was only an illness. I was in a hurry to overstep. I didn't kill a human being, but a principal. I killed the principal, but I didn't overstep. I stopped on this side. I was only capable of killing. And it seems I wasn't even capable of that. Principal? Why was that fool Razumian abusing the socialists? They are industrious, commercial people. The happiness of all is their case. No, life is only given to me once, and I shall never have it again. I don't want to wait for the happiness of all. I want to live myself, or else better not live at all. I simply couldn't pass by my mother starving, keeping my rouble in my pocket while I waited for the happiness of all. I am putting my little brick into the happiness of all, and so my heart is at peace. Ha <laughs> ha! Why have you let me slip? I only live once. I too want— Eh! I am an aesthetic louse, and nothing more!" he added suddenly, laughing like a madman. Yes, I am certainly a louse, he went on, clutching at the idea, gloating over it, and playing with it with a vindictive pleasure. In the first place, because I can reason that I am one, and secondly, because, for a month past, I have been troubling benevolent providence, calling it to witness that not for my own fleshly lust did I undertake it, but with a grand and noble object, ha <laughs> ha! Thirdly, because I aimed at carrying it out as justly as possible, weighing, measuring, and calculating. Of all the lice I picked out the most useless one, and proposed to take from her only as much as I needed for the first step, no more, no less, so the rest would have gone to a monastery according to her will, ha <laughs> ha! And what shows that I am utterly a louse, he added, grinding his teeth, is that I am perhaps viler and more loathsome than the louse I killed, and I felt beforehand that I should tell myself so after killing her. Can anything be compared with the horror of that? The vulgarity, the abjectness! I understand the prophet with his sabre on his steed. Allah commands and trembling creation must obey. The prophet is right. He is right when he sets a battery across the street and blows up the innocent and the guilty without deigning to explain. It's for you to obey, trembling creation, and not to have desires, for that's not for you. I shall never, never forgive the old woman." His hair was soaked with sweat, his quivering lips were parched, his eyes were fixed on the ceiling. Mother, sister, how I loved them! Why do I hate them now? Yes, I hate them. I feel a physical hatred for them. I can't bear them near me." I went up to my mother and kissed her, I remember. To embrace her and think if she only knew. Shall I tell her then? That's just what I might do. She must be the same as I am," he added, straining himself to think, as it were struggling with delirium. Ah, how I hate the old woman now! I feel I should kill her again if she came to life. Poor Lizaveta! Why did she come in? It's strange, though, why is it I scarcely ever think of her, as though I hadn't killed her? Lizaveta, Sonia, poor gentle things with gentle eyes! Dear women! Why don't they weep? Why don't they moan? They give up everything. Their eyes are soft and gentle. Sonia, Sonia! Gentle Sonia!" He lost consciousness. It seemed strange to him that he didn't remember how he got into the street. It was late evening. The twilight had fallen and the full moon was shining more and more brightly, but there was a peculiar breathlessness in the air. There were crowds of people in the street. Workmen and business people were making their way home. Other people had come out for a walk. There was a smell of mortar, dust and stagnant water. Raskolnikov walked along, mournful and anxious. He was distinctly aware of having come out with a purpose, of having to do something in a hurry, but what it was he had forgotten. Suddenly he stood still and saw a man standing on the other side of the street beckoning to him. He crossed over to him. 
but at once the man turned and walked away with his head hanging, as though he had made no sign to him. Stay! Did he really beckon? Raskolnikov wondered, but he tried to overtake him. When he was within ten paces, he recognized him and was frightened. It was the same man with stooping shoulders in the long coat. Raskolnikov followed him at a distance. His heart was beating. They went down a turning. The man still did not look round. "'Does he know I am following him?' thought Raskolnikov. The man went into the gateway of a big house. Raskolnikov hastened to the gate and looked in to see whether he would look round and sign to him. In the courtyard the man did turn round and again seemed to beckon him. Raskolnikov at once followed him into the yard, but the man was gone. He must have gone up the first staircase. Raskolnikov rushed after him. He heard slow, measured steps two flights above. The staircase seemed strangely familiar. He reached the window on the first floor. The moon shone through the panes with a melancholy and mysterious light. Then he reached the second floor. Bah! This is the flat where the painters were at work! But how was it he did not recognize it at once? The steps of the man above had died away. So he must have stopped or hidden somewhere. He reached the third story. Should he go on? There was a stillness that was dreadful. But he went on. The sound of his own footsteps scared and frightened him. How dark it was! The man must be hiding in some corner here. Ah, the flat was standing wide open. He hesitated and went in. It was very dark and empty in the passage, as though everything had been removed. He crept on tiptoe into the parlour which was flooded with moonlight. Everything there was as before, the chairs, the looking-glass, the yellow sofa, and the pictures in the frames. A huge, round, copper-red moon looked in at the windows. "'It's the moon that makes it so still, weaving some mystery,' thought Raskolnikov. He stood and waited, waited a long while, and the more silent the moonlight, the more violently his heart beat, till it was painful. And still the same hush. Suddenly he heard a momentary sharp crack like the snapping of a splinter and all was still again. A fly flew up suddenly and struck the window-pane with a plaintive buzz. At that moment he noticed in the corner between the window and the little cupboard something like a cloak hanging on the wall. Why is that cloak here? he thought. It wasn't there before. He went up to it quietly and felt that there was someone hiding behind it. He cautiously moved the cloak and saw, sitting on a chair in the corner, the old woman bent double so that he couldn't see her face. But it was she. He stood over her. She is afraid, he thought. He stealthily took the axe from the noose and struck her one blow, then another on the skull. But strange to say, she did not stir, as though she were made of wood. He was frightened, bent down nearer and tried to look at her, but she too bent her head lower. He bent right down to the ground and peeped up into her face from below. He peeped and turned cold with horror. The old woman was sitting and laughing, shaking with noiseless laughter, doing her utmost that he should not hear it. Suddenly he fancied that the door from the bedroom was opened a little, and that there was laughter and whispering within. He was overcome with frenzy, and he began hitting the old woman on the head with all his force. But at every blow of the axe the laughter and whispering from the bedroom grew louder, and the old woman was simply shaking with mirth. He was rushing away, but the passage was full of people. The doors of the flat stood open, and on the landing, on the stairs, and everywhere below there were people rows of heads, all looking, but huddled together in silence and expectation. Something gripped his heart, his legs were rooted to the spot, they would not move. He tried to scream and woke up. He drew a deep breath, but his dream seemed strangely to persist. His door was flung open, and a man whom he had never seen stood in the doorway watching him intently. Raskolnikov had hardly opened his eyes, and he instantly closed them again. He lay on his back without stirring. "'Is it still a dream?' he wondered, and again raised his eyelids hardly perceptibly. The stranger was standing in the same place, still watching him. He stepped cautiously into the room, 
carefully closing the door after him. He went up to the table, paused a moment, still keeping his eyes on Raskolnikov, and noiselessly seated himself on the chair by the sofa. He put his hat on the floor beside him, and leaned his hands on his cane and his chin on his hands. It was evident that he was prepared to wait indefinitely. As far as Raskolnikov could make out from his stolen glances, he was a man no longer young, stout, with a full, fair, almost whitish beard. Ten minutes passed. It was still light, but beginning to get dusk. There was complete stillness in the room. Not a sound came from the stairs. Only a big fly buzzed and fluttered against the window-pane. It was unbearable at last. Raskolnikov suddenly got up and sat on the sofa. Come, tell me what you want. I knew you were not asleep, but only pretending," the stranger answered oddly, laughing calmly. Arkady Ivanovich Svidrigailov, allow me to introduce myself. End of Part 3, Chapter 6